On, on behalf of the Office for Outer Space Affairs and the Center for Special Information Science at the University of Tokyo, we welcome you all to this three days workshop. Um, a few reminders before we get started, and I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Patrick Gindler. Patrick. And thank you, Shafa. Um, first, uh, please uh, allow me to welcome all of you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, we are really glad to have uh, all of you here. And uh, I just want to take the opportunity just uh, to remind uh, a few things which were all already mentioned in my mail, but just to remind you. So, um, yeah, just to let you know and that this meeting will be recorded and that uh, we are planning to uh, publish parts of it or maybe the whole uh, the whole meeting um, on the web so that people can uh, and also uh, giving you the possibility to access it uh, later on should should there be any information that you would like to retrieve um, and another point um, just also let me rem remind you um, that um, due to a tight schedule um, we would kindly ask you to post any questions you may have in the chat we have uh, some colleagues and uh, moderators who will be monitoring the chat and either reply to you uh, in the chat itself or um, later on time permitting. We might also uh, actually open the floor for questions, but um, this I leave it up to the moderator to decide um, and to see how we proceed. Um, that's it from my side. So uh, thank you very much again and uh, I'm giving back the floor to my colleague Shafa. Thank you, Patrick. Well, this workshop is a continuation of a series of the three training courses which we held uh, from 2018 um, through 2020. At this workshop, um, together with my colleagues from India, European Commission, European Space Agency and Japan, we aim to provide uh, knowledge about the use of low-cost GNSS receiver systems for high accuracy positioning and data processing. So if you allow me, I will um, begin this, this workshop uh, with the presentation on International uh, Committee on Global Navigation Satellite Systems, which is one of the, were the, one of the co-sponsors of the series of their workshops uh, since 2018. And, um, also is co-organizer of, of this workshop. Uh, I will also moderate this, this workshop today and the, the following days. Unfortunately, I, will, I cannot join through the, the video and it will be only on the audio connection on my side. So let me just share my, my presentation. All right, so as I said, I will be talking about the International Committee on Global Navigation Satellite Systems and its activities. So our office is serving as the executive secretariat of this committee, which has been established in 2005 and provides a mechanism for multilateral discussion and coordination on GNSS issues of concern. It encourages coordination among GNSS providers, promotes the introduction and utilization of GNSS services in developing countries, assists GNSS users with their development plans and applications, contributes to the sustainable development of the world, and assures that GNSS interoperability and uh, compatibility among providers and, sorry, uh, Uh, users global um, GNSS. ICG um, meets annually. Its membership consists of members, which are mainly current and future uh, core regional augmentation system providers, um, as well as the uh, member states of the United Nations. The core, um, current and future core uh, system providers um, formed also the Providers Forum 
and provider a forum normally discuss the matters related to open service information dissemination, open service performance, and spectrum protection. Um, the other members of ICG in the capacity of as associate members and observers are international organizations, uh, um, among which are governmental or non-governmental organizations, as well as the United Nations entities. ICG meets uh, annually since 2005. Our um, last meeting was held in 2019 in India. Our office will be ho hosting uh, this year 15th meeting of um, ICD here in Vienna from 27th September to 1st of October. And United Arab Emirates, as one of the members of ICD, expressed an interest to host our 16 meetings next year. Um, the work of ICG carried out by the four working groups, which are uh, listed in this in these slides. The working group on system signals and services, which is led by the United States and Russian Federation, uh, discussing the matters related to compatibility and spectrum protection, interoperability and service standards, system of system operations. Uh, the Working Group on Enhancement of DNSS Performance, New Services and Capabilities, uh, led by India, China and European Space Agency, is uh, looking at the future novel integrity solutions, implementation of interoperable DNSS space service volume um, and its evolution, as well as uh, looking at the um, uh, applications um, related to space weather and remote sensing applications. The, Working Group on Information Dissemination Capacity Building is led by our office and focused on education and training pro, uh, programs promoting DNSS for scientific exploration. The Working Group on Reference Frames, Timing and Applications, which is led by three international organizations, is focused on monitoring and reference station networks. Below you see the link to the um, website where all the work carried out by these working groups is um, archived and uh, you you can uh, look at them. Then just a few extracts from the latest meeting of ICG, um, the working group S, uh, the, the, the work um, here and then um, which is on compatibility and spectrum protection. Um, this work, uh, this subgroup continues campaign to promote protection of DNSS spectrum through education and outreach. And the link here uh, provides the access to the materials which is um, accumulated throughout all these um, workshops and training courses we, we have organized. The, uh, the outline of the working group B, which I would like to bring to your attention, is the um, uh, publication on the space uh, service volume. Uh, this is um, about the DNSS SSV and will uh, and enable ambitious future missions and activities in the context of the space exploration going beyond low Earth orbit to the Moon, Mars, and other celestial bodies. Below the link to the to the brochure. Um, the work, uh, a few lines from the work carried out by the working group D, um, it's, main, it's the progress in the areas related to the um, uh, refinement of the alignment of Genesis reference frames to the international terrestrial reference frame, as well as um, on Genesis timing references and the intercomparison of Genesis time offsets. All the work carried out uh, by this uh, uh, working group um, is uh, in the link uh, below. Also, jointly with the working group B and um, S, this uh, working group uh, started discussions on interoperability of DNSS precise point positioning uh, services. A few lines about the, our office uh, as a lead of the working group C on capacity building. We organize uh, a series of the regional workshops and training courses on the use and applications of DNSS in order to reinforce the exchange of information between countries and scale up the cap capacities in the regions for pursuing the application of DNSS solutions. 
Also looking at the sustainability at modernization of DNSS continuously operating reference stations and geospatial infrastructure through capacity uh, development and the, the matters related to space weather and DNSS, which include the description of the science of space weather and how to perform ionospheric and space weather research with DNSS data. In conclusion, the activities and opportunities that provided through the ICD result in the development and growth of capacities that will enable each country to enhance its knowledge, understanding and practical experience in those aspects of GNSS technology that have the potential for a greater impact on its economic and social development, including the preservation of its environment. All the information related to ICD is available on this um, link. Uh, the first link is just to the information portal of ICD. The second link will provide you the link to the, all the publications of, of the ICD. With that, I conclude my, my presentation and um, would like to, uh, to invite um, our um, next um, presenter, also co-host of this um, workshop, my colleague uh, from the University of Tokyo, Mr. Denise Manander. Denise, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Shafa. I hope the voice is clear. So can I share my slide? I will show one slide or a few slides actually. Can you see my slide? Yes, you yes. can see your slide. OK, OK. So first of all, I would like to invite all the participants who are attending from around the world. Uh, so we had so many uh, applications and you can see the list of the countries here. Okay. So I, I think there are around 70 countries like that. And these are the, the participating organization types. So you can see from government, independent or the, I mean the personal. And basically we have so many from research and universities and the government institutes and also from space agency. So this is a statistics of uh, our participation. And as Safa explained that we do this type of training once a year in January, but uh, due to COVID this time we could not do uh, the physical training. Uh, we, we used to held this training every year in January in Thailand at EIT. But this time, so we decided to do online and then we we got so many applications and more than 350 applications, but our system doesn't allow everybody to to be online. So we need to filter a little bit on that. So sorry for those who could not attend today, but the, on this online material and everything will be available uh, after the meeting as well. So let me show you a little bit about the, our work and what we are doing and what we want to do as well. So basically we want to promote the GNSS technology around the world. So as a, being a university member or faculty here, so basically we do the workshop trainings, workshop seminars and so on. But since we are located in Asia, so we basically focus on Asia. So currently we have our networks in these countries. And also we have uh, some network in the Mozambique and Rwanda in the universities there in African countries. And we do a lot of webinars as well around the world. And we are welcome to any joint research or pilot projects on different types of uh, topics. These are just some example, but it depends upon your interest and our interest on what we can do. Okay. Also, we do install, we install the uh, course in different countries as well. So we have installed the course station in some of these countries and we are going to expand this network in the coming year as well. And also we have a multi GNSS Asia in the Japan. So they are doing again the international collaboration and also many trainings and all. And also we, uh, and my basic target is to do the development of low cost, high accuracy poisoning system. So this is the main topic for this training and we'll be doing lots of exercise uh, tomorrow and day after. And we'll tell you how you can achieve very high accuracy using the 
uh, low cost receiver systems, which is uh, commonly available in the market today. Okay. And regarding all these trainings, so the University of Tokyo, as well as Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology, uh, the team, so we have another big team from uh, Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology. They do summer school every year. And I suppose that uh, many of you have uh, joined this training in the past uh, few years. Okay. So also we have uh, the whole team from uh, Tokyo University of Marine Science tomorrow to teach you again how to do article leave and also please be ready for that uh, training part as well. So I would like to show you some uh, pictures of our previous uh, events in the Thailand. Uh, so we do every year in January, so this year we could not. So this is how it looked like last year. We so this month last year we had around I think seven I think 80 participants altogether. So this is how it looks like. So it's a physical training. Everybody comes here for one week and they do uh, lots of work. And when they go back, they really learn learn a uh, lot. And this is in 2019, also in January. So and this is our first training in 2018. Okay, so. The uh, participants increasing every year. Okay, so I just put a summary here for the last uh, three, four, three years, 18, 19, 20, and this is this time, and you can see the statistics here. So this time we have around 270 registered participants, but today not everybody is attending. I hope they will attend more, or due to the time difference, because it's all around the world. So somebody's maybe in the midnight now, or somebody early morning, or somebody uh, late at night. Anyway, so we have this number to this time. So and also we need to arrange the resource persons. So this is very, very important. So we to find out the, the resource persons around the world to teach you uh, the core things of the GNSS. So please uh, ask them as many questions as possible or send the questions in chat so that you can uh, learn more. Although the PowerPoint presentations and all may not be very detailed, but uh, the key resource persons are the experts in these fields, so please feel free to ask any type of questions. So our PowerPoint is just a reference material. They will be available after the training, so you can refer them later. So during the training, we want to focus more on the practical hands-on training sessions tomorrow and the after. So today is more we do on the theoretical presentations. And this time we have uh, more than 70 countries and we have resource persons from, I, to, I think, four or five countries. I think it's four countries now. Okay. okay, I just skip some of these. So some pictures here. So when we do the training, actually we do this type of training. We arrange the receiver for all the teams. We have, uh, I think, 20, 25 teams. So every team has a three, four members and they do the field survey doing for two, three days and learning a lot on this. But this time, unfortunately, we cannot do this type of training. So it's more online, but still we try our best to do something. So we, instead of canceling this training, so we want to do something that is possible online. Okay. So this is how it looks like. So both the classroom lectures, so lots of work on teamwork and all, and also the field work. Okay. This is our working uh, style for this training. So on the last day, then they are more getting more mature on doing the data processing and getting good results. And also we have uh, some a little bit of this type of uh, uh, services. Okay. So since there are 100 like that of participants even in physical, so we really need a large hall to do this. So we, we used to do this in the auditorium of the, uh, this uh, university campus in that EIT. And these are some other information, so you can check these informations later in the homepage. Uh, but I would like to show you some of our stations in Asia. So if I suppose that there are many people, participants from uh, these countries, so they can access the data from the, your, your uh, universities or the university in your country. So please feel free to get the data or do some uh, something that that you want to do or please let us know if you want to do uh, some uh, joint work but this is the main thing that we'll be doing tomorrow and the after how to get a very high accuracy using different technique called rtk or madoka or ppp so it's not only madoka but also there are other type of a ppp so you will hear from today as well in the galileo okay. 
And this is our target, how to make the receiver cost very, very low, because uh, if you need to pay uh, $5,000 for RTK or high accuracy receiver in Asia, it's not possible, especially in universities, it's very, very difficult. So our target is to make the receiver cost as low as possible and and still to get a very high accuracy. So when I say accuracy, this is better than uh, one meter or 10 to 70 centimeter of accuracy. And the price is not less than uh, uh, 500 or less than, so our target is 100, but at the moment, this is still a little bit difficult. This is okay, this is okay. One little price is a matter. So this was our crude, uh, low cost system in 2016. So uh, as we keep on working and working, so now we have a very nice and very small and very good system. So you can see all these developments. So tomorrow we'll show you the receivers and software and all. And this is also for Madoka, the system from the Japanese QGS satellite, this service. So you can have a 10 or 20 centimeter of accuracy using this one. Okay, so this is a very, very compact receiver. You see this is a very small receiver, about five, five centi, six centimeter by six centimeter. And then you can get a 10, 20 centimeter of accuracy. Or you can use it a Raspberry Pi or Android or Windows, whatever you want. Okay. So this is how it looks like. Okay. So this we'll be doing tomorrow in detail. And these are some of the facilities we have in the university. You can access this data if you want to do something. Okay, we have so many different types of receivers and some special equipments to do all these data analysis. Okay, so that's all from my side and thank you very much. So we'll share this material, so please check for details on that. And thank you once again for attending this uh, session. Thank okay. you, Dinesh. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dinesh. There is a, one question here, if you could Please uh, yep. quickly answer it. It's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. uh, question about uh, any plan for GNSS course installation in the Pacific Islands. Yeah, we, we, we do have that. Actually, we were discussing in Fiji after the ICG. So uh, which, which country is this in the Pacific? Um, well, I don't see the yeah. country. Uh, the okay. name is Nom okay. uh, okay. Saili. Mm -hmm. Maybe later on we, uh, mm. we you can exchange the um, this yeah. this uh, questions through the, the, the emails. Mm -hmm. um, okay, okay. If if you please could write email to Dinesh yeah. and then he will explain yeah. you yeah. Uh, in his yeah, email. Yeah, we Thank have you. we have a plan to do this network extension in the Pacific yeah. or even in Africa or in the South America if uh, you are interested. So, but we need to work on and see how we can collaborate. Yeah, yeah we, we do have them. Thank you, Dinesh. Um, if uh, you may wish also to write your questions um, to, to myself or Patrick, you have our emails and we would be happy to uh, refer you to them, to our speakers later on. Now, um, I would like to invite uh, our next uh, speaker. Um, it's my colleague from the European Commission, Mr. Dominique Hayes. He will uh, talk about the Galileo and its applications. Dominique, the floor is yours. And if, if you could please say a few words about yourself as well. Thank you. Good morning, Shafa, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest edition of The Truman Show. Uh, it feels especially like that when you don't realise your video camera is on. But uh, hopefully now you can see me and also see my presentation. So I'm uh, working at the European Commission. We are the programme manager for the Galileo programme. Um, I'm responsible for frequency aspects of the European Union space programme which includes Galileo, EGNOS, which is a, a regional SBAS system, and also Copernicus, which is our Earth observation system. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about Galileo with one slide on EGNOS. So uh, if you take away one slide today about Galileo, it's this one. So Galileo is an accurate global navigation system, gives you accuracy down to around one meter in positioning and to around below five nanoseconds in timing. Uh, so we now have 
approximately or well, almost two billion devices out there that are Galileo capable. If you have a relatively recent smartphone, there's a good chance that it will have Galileo uh, built in. So you could well be a, one of our Galileo users. Uh, we were the first. Dominic, Dominic could ah, you share your yes. slide? Sorry. Oh, are you, you're not seeing my slide. Uh, uh, please, can you see? Uh, yes. Yeah. My apologies. Are you seeing the slides? No, not yet. No, no not yet. Okay. No, it's on the... How about now? Yes, I think okay. you're seeing it now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so my, my apologies. Uh, so I go back to the uh, the cover slide. I can hear an echo online. So could you all please mute your microphones? Thank you. So as I said, this is the the slide. If you take one slide away, this is this is it. Um, so I've covered the first few bullet points. Uh, I was just getting on to the fact that we were the, we were the first global mass market dual frequency GNSS system using the E1 and E5 frequencies. Uh, the frequencies are shown there. Uh, we also have a built in uh, search and rescue service, which is into, fully integrated into the COSPUS SARSAT system. And we know for a fact that this has already saved lives. Um, coming soon, or coming, maybe not so soon, 2023, we have something called the navigation message authentication, uh, which will give you some uh, enhanced confidence that the signals you're receiving are actually from Galileo and not from a spoofer. Uh, also coming is a 20 centimeter accuracy service, which uh, one of the latest speakers, Daniel, my colleague at the European Space Agency, will speak about. That uses the third frequency, what we call E6. Uh, if you're a QZ, QZSS uh, user, you'll know that as L6. And then coming on the same frequency, uh, shortly after that will be a unique authentication feature, which will be even more um, confidence in the signals coming from Galileo. And that's for the first generation. Uh, we already have in, in the pipeline our plans for the next generation, which will offer even more features for you. So where are we now in 2020? So we have a world-class space program within the European Union, as I mentioned already, which we have Copernicus, the Earth Observation System, EGNOS, which is a regional SBAS, uh, and Galileo, which is what I'm gonna be talking about today. So it's managed by the European Commission, uh, Directorate General for Defence Industry and Space, which is which is uh, who I work for, and also partly managed by the new EU Space Programme Agency, USPA, formerly known as the GSA. Oh, in fact, I think it's still known as the GSA. The change is happening very imminently. Um, system design is by the European Space Agency. My colleague Daniel will be, will be speaking later. And we have a budget for the next seven years of about seven uh, 17, 13 billion euros, and that's currently, uh, in fact, it's not no longer under discussion. It's been finalised by the European Parliament, and that will cover operational, developmental, and research costs over the next uh, seven years, as I mentioned. So a little bit about the history of Galileo and its deployment. So in 2005, we launched the test satellites, which secured the foundations for our frequency use in space. Uh, 2013, we had the in-orbit validation, which was a, a series of four satellites that were launched to basically test the system fully. Uh, in 2015-16, we launched the initial Galileo services, which included the open service, the search and rescue service, the public regulated service, which is a governmental signal as well as the commercial service demonstrator. And then in 2017, 2019, we had the ex what we call the exploitation phase for the, um, for the full operational uh, configuration of the system. And then from 2020, 21 really should be, we will have the full operational capability of the, of the system. And then after 2021, we're, as I said, working towards the second generation of Galileo. Um, which will be coming online probably around 2030. 
But before that, we'll have the full operational configuration of uh, Galileo. So this is the constellation that we have. Uh, it's now stable. Uh, so we operate in three planes, three orbital planes. We currently have 26 satellites, 24 of which are transmitting navigation signals. Um, we have um, 24 satellites also transmitting the, or rather receiving the search and rescue um, signals transmitted by emergency beacons when they are activated and that's also fully operational. So this is the one slide about EGNOS which is our regional um, SBAS system, so space-based augmentation. So this augments GPS, uh, provides integrity data for safety of life applications for things like um, precision landings for aircraft, it can be used in, in rail, road tolling, and remotely piloted vehicles, um, so-called drones. Uh, it also enables things like precision farming. Uh, if you have an EGNOS enabled receiver on your tractor, it can deliver your accuracies down to around half a meter, which is enough for many precision farming applications. So EGNOS has been in service since around 2011 and it covers the EU mainly, but also the surrounding region. So uh, looking at this map, you can see the North of Africa, parts of Eastern Europe, and uh, extends up into where the geostationary satellites can cover. So it's kind of like the, the lower, lower areas of Norway, for example, and Iceland, which it, which it also covers. Um, a little bit about the financial benefits of GNSS to Europe. So EGNOS and Galileo alone are estimated to bring a net benefit of 60 billion euros to the EU economy. That's uh, up to the year 2027. So you can see that together EGNOS and Galileo provide a significant economic boost to uh, the European economy. And that's uh, the uh, that's EGNOS and Galileo alone, not GNSS as a whole. So this is the extra value provided by EGNOS and Galileo. So that's a big number, 60 billion euros. <clears throat> and then for the accuracy. So we have, uh, we're actually very proud of our accuracy for, for Galileo. We're getting a stable accuracy of below around 25 centimeters in ranging accuracy from satellite. So this is not the accuracy that you will get from your, your smartphone, but it's, just, it's the ranging accuracy from the satellites to a fixed position on the ground. So it's a, a fundamental metric for the accuracy of any system is the ranging performance. And so we're getting an accuracy of around uh, below uh, 25 centimeters at the moment. And that, that will only get better as our system matures. Um, so I spoke about positioning uh, for timing, which is often the, unfor is often the forgotten uh, utility of a GNSS system. So we're getting timing accuracies down to around um, below. Uh, so for the, the broadcast offset to UTC, it's around 2.5 nanoseconds. And for the GGTO accuracy, which is the timing offset relative to GPS, it's around four nanoseconds. So those are very good numbers and they're well within what we uh, are targeting for our system. Um, timing is also very important. I, I don't know if you know, but timing is, as I said, it's often the forgotten utility of GNSS. Timing is crucial for many network activities. It synchronizes many of the telecoms networks. It's, it synchronizes utilities, electricity distribution. Um, most of the distribution networks have some kind of reference to GNSS. So Galileo contributes to that precision timing. Um, I like to think that we are now a reliable system. We did have a major outage in July 2019. Um, we have recovered from that fully. We had a, an investigation board. We looked at the causes of that. Um, running a GNSS system is a very difficult activity we're finding. Um, so we're, we're confident now with the, with the board that was uh, made a number of recommendations that we are now going to be a, a much more reliable system. Having said that, we did have another outage um, a few weeks ago. It's for an hour or so or a couple of hours. 
Um, but it's, it really goes to show how difficult it is to run a reliable system. Uh, if you want details of the performance achieved by all of the GNSS systems, you can see a website there, www.galmon.eu. That's a website that gives you data on performance data on all of the GNSS. Uh, it's a very useful uh, website to go and look at to see performance metrics of the, the various systems. Uh, this slide will show you the performance in detail. I won't go into uh, detail on it, but uh, the, the highlights for us are the performance in single frequency and dual frequency mode. Uh, I mentioned that we were the first global mass market dual frequency system, so you can get the best accuracy using dual frequency or even triple, triple frequency, uh, but for most smartphones they're equipped with single frequency uh, chipsets, uh, but even with, with single frequency alone, you are getting a very good level of performance from Galileo. Uh, and you can check those numbers after the uh, presentation. So uh, we're accurate and, and even more precise. Um, so we've had the high accuracy service coming online in the next few years. Um, our target accuracy is down to around 20 centimetres. I won't go into the details of this slide because Daniel is going to be talking about this later on. But uh, this is something we're very excited about. Uh, we think it's going to be a game changer for many applications because it's one of the um, one of the free to free to air services that we'll be, we will be offering, uh, as I said, down to around 20 centimeters accuracy. So we're a trusted system. Uh, I mentioned we have the navigation message authentication on the open service also scheduled for release around 2023. Uh, we are currently in, in a test phase for that system. It's fully defined. We have uh, associated electronics, uh, an OS NMA module qualified and integrated. Uh, we're doing some internal testing at the moment. We're working with receivers and applications uh, to make sure that we can roll out that service uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the next steps will be to consolidate and ensure high robustness before we declare a system operational. Um, and we'll, we'll also be publishing a, an official signal in space ICD and receiver guideline, so it will include the um, open service navigation mes message authentication. And we'll be even more secured after we've released OS NMA because we plan to introduce the commercial authentication service using the third frequency of Galileo on E6. This will offer an even stronger level of protection than OS NMA using an encrypted navigation signal on E6. Um, we've now agreed the system capabilities and timeline for that deployment, and we have a feasible service concept proposed and under discussion within the member states. That will be a chargeable service. Uh, we think it will be used by companies that really need the assurance that the signal is coming from uh, Galileo and GNSS and not from a spoofer. So things like insurance, um, maybe maybe your car system will be based on uh, your position uh, in the future and that needs you need to have an assurance that you, you are where you say you are not where a spoofing device device um, uh, tell or tries to trick your GNSS receiver into believing it is. Um, maybe also financial transactions. Uh, timing is very, very crucial to financial transactions. So maybe there will be a, a timestamp incorporated into maybe a blockchain in future using the commercial authentication service. So that's a very another very exciting feature uh, that's currently you or will be unique to Galileo when it's released uh, in, in the coming years. Um, so we're a protected system. I mentioned a little bit about the search and rescue uh, localization service. I, 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 ha I have another couple of slides at the end of the presentation that I won't, I don't plan to present, but you can look at them offline. Um, the search and rescue service is our localization service that picks up uh, emergency distress beacon signals that are transmitted on the 406 megahertz signal. This is an internationally recognized frequency for emergency distress beacons. It's up, in, up and running now. Um, as I mentioned, it has uh, already saved lives or contributed to saving lives, uh, provides excellent performance. 
Previously, it could take up to four hours for a distress beacon to be detected by the COSMOS SARSAT system. Now that detection is done in under five minutes. And also the detection uh, is down to around 500 meters. We say it's below a kilometer, but in reality, it's closer to 500 meters. And that's reduced from what was about five kilometers. So that's relying just on the 406 uh, megahertz signal, not on the GNSS capabilities of the beacon. So that's actually a, a, a drastic improvement in the localization performance of, um, of Cosmos SARSAT using the Galileo uh, Search and Rescue Service. We also have what we call the return link service for the, the Search and Rescue Service. So this will be providing a feature whereby beacons that have been activated and detected can be effectively told that they have been detected. So if you imagine you're on a, sh a sinking ship and you set off your emergency beacon, you don't know whether that beacon has been detected. Until now, you had no way of knowing that your, your rescue signal had been received. So that you, know, you weren't sure whether you were being going to be rescued. But now with the return link service, we have the capability to inform users of beacons that their beacon message has been received and that help is on its way. So this is another major uh, enhancement to the, the COSPAS SARSAT system. And you can imagine if your ship is sinking, it gives you a, a boost to know that someone is on their way. It gives you an extra boost and hopefully will improve your morale in a very difficult situation. Uh, because it uses the 406, the International 406 megahertz signal, it's already compatible with beacons out there. And we know that half of beacon manufacturers are designing designing their um, new beacons to actually receive the return link service. So even without um, even without the new features, you will have improved performance in your in your beacon. So you'll get detection in less than five minutes and localization down to 500 meters. But if you have one of the new the new beacons, a new generation of beacons, you'll be able to use the return link service. So you get the message that help is on its way. So also in Europe, we have um, GNSS being integrated into the legislation. In Europe, we have what's called eCall. So if you're if you have an emergency in your car uh, and you have an accident, um, your car will automatically dial the emergency services. This is now mandatory in all vehicles produced in the European Union. So once your car has dialed the emergency services, it will send in that message a location uh, signal and that signal will give your localization. So it will tell you what your position is using GNSS. Um, so that's also contributing to road safety, uh, allows the emergency services to reach you faster and uh, almost certainly that will save lives. Uh, Galileo was also used in something called E112. Uh, it's emergency call location, similar to the E911 that's active in the US and very similar to e-call in operation. So when you dial the emergency services, your location will be transmitted to, to the emergency services so they know where you are and get, can get to you faster. So we had the uh, incident in July 2019 where we lost uh, our service for almost a week. Um, we had a very uh, substantial investigation into that outage and a number of recommendations were made and we have re reviewed our operational procedures and also toughened our cybersecurity aspects. It wasn't, an it wasn't related to the, the outage, but nonetheless, we took the opportunity to improve the robustness of, of our system which is very important to our users, not just accuracy, precision, but resilience is also very important for GNSS users. So now that the, the Galileo signal is out there and in receivers, we have a very customer, what we like to think is a very customer centric approach. Um, so we have a, our GSA, our GSA or USPA uh, agency that uh, works with manufacturers and user communities. They register or have registered users that uh, give additional benefits to find out um, 
how best to use GNSS and particularly uh, the Galileo aspects of the system. Um, so they have a very strong user community there using um, interfacing with, with the agency. Um, GSA also publishes what's known or what's called the, the market uh, the market report. You can see there in the bottom right hand corner that the last issue was 2019. It's, it comes out every two years, so I can I would estimate that there will be another issue this year. It's a very useful document to assess how GNSS is being used across across the world in, in various different markets. Uh, it's always a very good read. Um, there's another document that they produced called the, the GNSS User Technology Report, and that came out um, at the end of last year. It's also a very interesting read, and uh, if you're a more technical user, and I think you are because this is a very technical course, you will find that a, a very interesting document to read. Uh, tells you all about GNSS technologies, as well as some of the associated uh, technologies that can use GNSS, uh, as well as communication aspects. Uh, we're working uh, to enhance the uh, power efficiency um, so that uh, our GNSS chipsets can be used in the Internet of Things. Uh, it's, it's a big market that will be coming in future. Uh, GNSS is also being used in, in European Rail. There's a, a system called European Rail uh, Timing Monitoring System, I think, ERTMS in Europe. Uh, so EGNS supports that. Uh, EGNSS is being used, uh, Galileo is being used in the Prague public transport system. Uh, SAR beacons are being used in fishing vessels, and we, need, we have now have a, a remote activation of those SAR beacons is possible with the new generation of beacons. And G GSA also developed the Green Lane application, which can, which can be used by truckers, uh, truck drivers in Europe to uh, gauge the delays at border crossings due to the, uh, the COVID crisis. And that was introduced last year. And it's been a, a big boost to the, the trucking industry and helping them to cross borders uh, in the EU that have been set up. Uh, as a result of um, COVID. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you can see a number of the, the markets that, that we are engaged with and the GSA are following to make sure that we are um, fully integrated in those uh, markets. Um, I mentioned uh, approximately 2 billion receivers that we're now installed in. If you go to the website there, uh, usegalileo.eu, it will give you a list of all of the chipsets and devices that can currently use Galileo. Um, Shaffer spoke briefly about the uh, the topic of GNSS spectrum protection that the ICG is involved in. So we work with also we also work with member states of the European Union to keep the GNSS spectrum free from interference. Um, uh, one of the things I do is chair a task force on uh, interference within the EU. That is specially designed or specially targeted to try to prevent the use of what we call plug-in jammers uh, in cars. These are devices that plug into cigarette lighters in cars that transmit a jamming signal that can wipe out GNSS reception in an area, not just in the car, but some distance around the car. I think many people, many people who use these plug-in jammers don't realise the the, the damage that they cause to reception of GNSS, not just in the car, but up to around 100 metres, if not more, around, around the car. So we're also working with international partners within the ICG, but also at the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, um, to make sure that GNSS spectrum can be used without fear of interference. Uh, we're also working with uh, partners at the, uh, the ITU, with Beidou particularly, and also QCSS to um, improve the coexistence of GNSS with amateur radio users, which share the band uh, 1240 to 1300 megahertz with GNSS, so-called um, E6 frequency. And uh, that's a, a topic for WRC 23. Uh, World Radio Communication Conference in 2023. So accelerating the next generation of Galileo. So we have now um, service evolution planned. 
that will include a whole new range of services for Galileo that will include advanced timing services, space volume, uh, A-RAIN, which is uh, an aviation uh, aug augmentation, well not an augmentation, it's a, an aviation um, an aviation feature that will uh, give the aviation community enhanced confidence in uh, GNSS. Uh, we have new emergency warning services planned, um, improve, more improvements in the search and rescue service, the ionospheric prediction service, and we will evolve the signal evolution or we will evolve signals of Galileo to make sure that they offer even more, uh, even better performance and uh, more robustness. Uh, I guess the latest thing I can tell you about is we just launched the, the latest uh, signal in space interface control document, ICD version 2, that's downloadable from the GSA website. Uh, you can see the document there on, on the left. Um, so I would encourage you to download that. that. That includes details of some new features and enhancements we just announced about the, the Galileo signal that will give you even better performance than, than you currently can get. So it's aimed mainly at manufacturers of uh, Galileo receivers, but may also be of interest to some of you out there. Uh, we also have the documentation on the E6 uh, codes that can be used to develop the high accuracy service and the commercial authentication service. And we have um, the ionospheric correction algorithm for Galileo single frequency users, uh, so-called um, uh, using the Nyquik uh, model uh, for single frequency um, use. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, I can hear that I'm just about to be thrown, thrown out. So uh, I'm sorry if I have left no time for questions, but um, I hand over now back to the Thank you. So um, Dominique. Uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Dominique. Um, there is, we, we basically now moving to our next presentation, but before doing that, there is the, the question, very quick question from yep. the, I think the same same participant. Uh, he is from Samoa. Okay. Uh, the question is: Is the the performance accuracy uniform around the world, or is the is it best the European Union region? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so the performance that we get essentially is is around the world. So there are areas uh, latitudes mainly where you might get a slight improvement in performance because of the visibility of satellites. The orbits that we cover, we're in a 56 degree uh, inclination orbit. So the polar regions have a, they do have coverage from Galileo, uh, but it's not quite as good as it, it is at the latitudes around, um, uh, around the European latitudes and also the equivalent in the Southern hemisphere. But essentially the, uh, the yeah the 20 centimeter level of ranging accuracy you get from the satellites is achievable on a global basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and another quick question: a search and rescue service available in the Pacific? Oh yes, another good question. So I, I didn't mention that we have um, the what we call Mio look. So this is um, this is the receivers of the the signal actually from the Galileo service to the uh, rescue coordination centers that's we have three setups in Europe that that provide coverage in the European area we also have a, a, a Mio Lut in the Indian Ocean so that provides enhanced coverage there but we know that Mio Luts are also being set up in other parts of of the world so yes the enhanced um, accuracy and uh, position position localization localization can be achieved uh, globally because our search and rescue service tra picks up the Cosmos SARSAT distress beacon signals from wherever they are on on the ground. But the best performance at the moment is achieved in 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 Europe. Yes. Thank thank you, Dominic. There are a few more questions, um, but we will um, perhaps yeah. answer them when we 
we um, have a time a little bit later on. Okay. Thank you very right. much again, Dominique, for your time. And now we will move to our ne next uh, presentation, which will be made uh, by our colleague from India, Dr. Philip. He will introduce uh, the ISRO, ISRO's navigation programs called NAVIC and GAGAN. Dr. Philip, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Madam, for uh, and a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants for this uh, GNSS workshop. And first, let me thank uh, the organizers for uh, giving an opportunity to speak about uh, India's navigation program, Navik and Gagan. And uh, I hope all of you are in uh, and your family members are in good health in this pandemic condition and wish you all a uh, uh, very healthy life. And uh, now I'll go to my presentation. Uh, just one. Uh... Are you able to see the presentation? Yes, we can. Yes, see. we can see your presentation. Thank you. OK, one minute. Yeah. And then I'll be talking about uh, two navigation systems of uh, India. One first, it is, uh, let me introduce Navig, which is the navigation of Indian Constellation, okay. Navigation with Indian constellations is a regional navigation system, and uh, we are planning to have seven satellites. Right now, there are eight satellites uh, in orbit, and out of that, six can be used for navigation applications, and two are exclusively for satellite based messaging services. And then it provides uh, SP civilian as well as restricted uh, services in L5 and S1. And uh, then we are planning to go for L1 civilian signal from Nest satellite onwards. Because now our aim is make it seven. I think are only operational for uh, navigation purposes. And this uh, primary service area is uh, that the latitude by finding south the north and the longitude 55 degree east to 100 degree east and then another navigation is basically a espas uh, navigation that gagan it is gps aided geo augmented navigation system it is basically for a primary purposes for air navigation services safety of life of our indian uh, region and it is uh, certified for uh, RNB 0.01 and the APV 10. Yeah, basically, this uh, required navigation performance of 0.1 nautical mile and then approach procedure with the vertical guidance 101. And then uh, this is the first SPAS system to serve the equatorial anomaly region. Okay. And coming to some details about the nav Navic system. And as you can see from the figure, there are seven satellites planned, and four will be in GSO, and then three will be in GEO. So that uh, four uh, GSO that is for 55 degree east, and and then one 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 point seven five degree east, and three G, G, GEO satellites are 32.5, 83 degree east, and uh, at 109.5 degree east and we have established all the uh, what we call uh, range integrity monitoring system IRIMS then uh, CDMA ranging stations then we got laser ranging stations then TTNC and nav uplink stations and then coming to this thing and then finally the user community so and then say overall everything is in, in, a, in a navigation uh, center. 
and there are uh, additionally there are rns timing centers also and this gives the overall picture of a navigation uh, navic navigation system and that uh, we got uh, satellite in constellation 7 out of that six are operational now uh, yeah, immediately one additional satellite will be launched and then be operational and ground segment wise as i was mentioning there are two navigation centers and then uh, 17 reference stations out of which 15 are in india and two are uh, outside india and that outside india are uh, one is in mauritius and other one is bayak in indonesia in the, in the country of indonesia then coming cdma ranging station there are four stations and network timing centers two centers are there and control centers also there are two and frequency as i was mentioning l5ns and we are going to introduce l1 civilian signal also and uh, services are for an uh, uh, positioning system and for restricted users okay then this is uh, the navigation uh, as i was mentioning is a new generation signal l1 frequency band will be compatible and interoperable with l1 civil signal of gnss providers and uh, service area also i covered navic is offering short messaging services for users in indian region through that our two satellites are named nrnss 1a and nrnss 1g trista and then navic has been as uh, we know that been adopted for assisted gnss by global standards body 3 dpp third generation partnership project navic will be included in the release 16 lt long time evolution specification navic is incorporated into automotive industry standard 140 and navic has been incorporated in the national marine electronics association 0183 standard and recently as i think you may, you may do, uh, come to know navic has been accepted as a component of the worldwide radio navigation system for operations in the re indian region by international maritime organization imo coming to i mean regarding the uh, accuracy levels we are our uh, primary two sigma value of overall position accuracy is 10 meter and then uh, with uh, uh, hpe 5 meter and vpe 6 to 8 meter about the accuracy what we are achieving i think my colleague is having a presentation in the afternoon session so there he they will be presenting about the accuracy levels and uh, coming to the gagan system it is uh, jointly developed by indian space research organization isro and airport authority of india so this is to deploy and certify an operational espas for india to achieve an rnb of 0.01 capability over indian flight information region and this is the region where we uh, it will be covering and uh, apb one service over indian landmass on nominal days we have developed it in two phases first was the technology demonstration phase tds minimum set of ground and space elements implemented to demonstrate the proof of concept then we have made it operational phase fop certified build fs built over the tds element with additional ground and space elements and this is the overall architecture of current we are having three geo stationary satellites and there is uplink stations then uh, we are having reference earth stations then master control stations are all available and all are established and all the three satellites are giving services and this is uh, that already i have uh, gagan is certified by directorate uh, director general of civil aviation Uh, and uh, that rnb01 operations of our indian region is uh, approved in 30th december 2013 apb1 operations of our indian landmass 21st april 
Gagan is fully operational since the month of May 2015. There are three satellites at 1 at 55 degree east, it is with PRN 127, 1 at 83 degree with PRN 128, and uh, GZ 15 at uh, 93.5 degree with PRN 132. And this is also compatible and interoperable with other SPAS to provide seamless navigation. All aircraft being registered in India after June 2020 shall be suitably equipped with Gagan equipment. That is a requirement. And then Gagan certificate number, APV1 RNB certification are valid now. It is extended up to 2022 July. In applications of uh, Gagan and Navik, if you look at the total, there's a wide spectrum of applications that we are planning. Navigation guidance of marine services, then fisheries, mining, management of fleet movement, pollution avoidance for railways, town planning and road alignments, geographical information systems, power grid synchronization, automatic banking, precise farming, dispensing of fertilization irrigation, and en route and precision approach for aircraft. And this is a overall, this I am giving only the overall idea about our Gagan and Navik. And in the afternoon session, our colleagues will be presenting and the user aspects as well as the accuracy aspects will be covered in the subsequent sections. And with this, I would like to uh, conclude my presentation. Whether uh, you are able to uh, hi Patrick speaking Shasha, I don't know. Um we can't hear you. It seems that your mic you're not unmuted. What are they? Yeah, it's okay now. <laughs> I managed. Thank you very much, Dr. Philip, we will move now to our next presentation, which is on Navic applications. It is from our colleague from India, Mr. Uh, Nishkam Jain. Please, Mr. Jain, the floor is yours. Thank you, madam. I'll be sharing my screen. So are you able to see my screen now? Yeah, we see your screen. OK, we see your slides as well. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. So I welcome you all for this online training jointly organized by CSIS and ICG. Uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, Navic applications. I'm Nishkam Jain working in Space Application Center and in Indian Space Research Organization ISRO India at Ahmedabad. And uh, today we'll be discussing about the Navic applications in brief. So our uh, father of uh, Indian space program, Dr. Vikram Sai, uh, Sarabhai, has guided us that uh, we must use the technologies for the application of betterment of society. So in this case also our focus areas of developing a navigation application is how it can be used and solve the real problems of man and society. So already Navic has been introduced, so I'll just cover in brief that it is a regional navigation system providing accuracy uh, in India and the region extending beyond Indian boundary uh, up to 1500 kilometers. And there are two types of services which are position accuracy of better than 10 meters and a timing accuracy better than 20 nanoseconds. It is a fully self-reliant navigation system. 
and the services are currently being offered in L5 band and S band uh, in the, these two frequencies, uh, the SPS and RS service, and it is interoperable with other GNSS system providers. This is the ground trace of NAVIC, where you can see the satellites in GeoGSO orbits, and in between you can see the users, where uh, this is the principle where the so user is computing the ranges from all these satellites simultaneously and provide in computing its own position. On the left hand side, you can see the picture of a IRNSS satellite. And on the right hand side, you can see some of the results from our field trials where uh, we have uh, installed receivers on ships and they have gone beyond the service areas of NAVIC, like uh, parts of Africa and the parts of Southeast Asia as well. And we are getting very good performance out of these. This is the, uh, the segments in NAVIC, the space segment already talked about, comprises of seven satellites. The ground segment already talked about, which is working 24 cross seven to make sure you get the required PVT accuracies. And the third segment, which I'll be talking about are the IRNSS users. So how they can utilize these services. So if we see the GNSS market potential by applications, the major lion's share or the chunk of the applications are the location-based services, which is basically the way you are using your mobile phones and the position available from the mobile phones. And there are many apps and services that are very familiar. Uh, everybody must be familiar in today's world. So this comprises the major chunk of the applications and followed by the road transport, like uh, vehicle tracking applications and fleet tracking applications. And there are other significant as well, like surveying, maritime, railways, agriculture, aviation, and time synchronization also. So uh, we have the major chunks like the LBS, mobile phone based applications, then road navigation, then for railways, maritime, avionics, some uh, special applications for surveying, uh, crustal movements, natural resource management, town planning, precision farming, and especially the uh, other applications like disaster warning, search and uh, rescue operations, and uh, strategic applications as well. So this is the broad umbre umbrella of the applications. So these are the first generation of prototype NAVIC receivers developed at ISRO. So you can see these, uh, uh, these are the basically the FPGA-based versions, which, sub which support uh, GPS uh, and uh, NAVIC. L5 and S band and as well as Gagan systems. So comprising of all these, you can have a multitude of applications. And the recent one is the down, uh, uh, you can see the FPGA based miniaturized versions are also available. Then uh, and the, as a next step, ISRO carried out the activity of developing an ASIC chip. So we have a foundry in uh, SCL Chandigarh and there we have developed a base band Nav Navic ASIC. You can see the pictures here. And also the RF ASIC was also developed. So a combination of these two can lead to very miniaturized applications. These are the fully indigenous developments by ISRO. So these two are the photographs. So the uh, left one is the FPGA based versions for special applications. And uh, the, the, uh, the right one is the ASIC based version of the uh, chip. Apart from that, industry has also supported us and we have got uh, many uh, uh, chips available now in the market by many companies like Quicktel, you have Skytrack and then you have uh, Alistar and you have uh, Mutrack. So all these chips are available now in the market. They have been qualified by us and uh, are uh, using used in many applications So and give a combination of GPS and NAVIC also and in some of them S-band also. So you can have add-on options like dead reckoning and you can have various connectivity interfaces to design these applications. And IRNSS messaging service, which was uh, talked about, is also available in these chips. So uh, many of these chips are available. Uh, you, can, uh, you can have a look at all these chips. And recently, Sony Japan has also launched a chip, which is a very low cost device targeted for uh, basically wearable devices. So they all these all chips support uh, NAVIC. Now some of the applications, uh, uh, one is uh, the NAVIC messaging receiver. So we all are familiar that uh, when satellite navigation is used for P, V and T, position, velocity and timing. So as an add-on, we can also, we have added in a messaging service also in NAVIC. 
so you can get many very many alerts uh, some of the screenshots and some of the receivers are shown here i have a small video so this is the first prototype where a fisherman can uh, connect his own smartphone with the navic messaging receiver i hope you can see the video and uh, you can connect your peer your uh, basically phone with this uh, receiver and you can get ma very many alerts apart from your position in real time where you are that can be tracked or you can get the position your for your own uh, navigation apart from that you can get alerts like sometimes fishermen cross international boundaries so this app can give you an idea i mean how far you are from the boundary or are you in the safe zone fishing uh, second you can get alerts we have a network of remote sensing satellites where we give uh, regular alerts for weather cyclones tsunami so those alerts then potential fishing zone information also can be available and it supports all the regional and local languages so all these information uh, is can, can be disseminated right to the end user by these applications so these are some of the field photographs of the deployment and the apps next is the vehicle tracking system so this is the prototype which was developed and we have used within isro for tracking of isro's vehicle and then later on with this success uh, the regulation has come ais 140 where uh, more than 100 products are now available in the industry and for all public transport this is mandatory otherwise we, they won't get the rto clearance to use uh, vehicle tracking applications navic based vehicle tracking for their uh, for their uh, road navigation and this is a small video of our prototype like internally we ship uh, our uh, items from one center to another and in between they are tracked in real time so this is uh, uh, a demonstration of that application that navic satellites give you the position and on internet you can track on the real time basis where your cargo is this is a website which we have created for asset tracking so you can have a historical data also you can select the vehicle date and time and it can give you uh, all the information about it next is the navic based timing receiver as time uh, is a very important uh, uh, by product or the cl receiver clock bias is obtained so you can uh, generate a 1 pps timing signal and you can synchronize various devices out of it so in india we have synchronized in five grids are there so in each grid we have installed navic timing receiver and we have synchronized these grids uh, on a trial basis uh, to see the performance and we have got very good accuracy results so these are some of the field trial deployment of these receivers this is the website maintained which uh, shows you the navic time in real time and this uh, website uh, is synchronized using a navic timing receivers and the ntp time server so you can have de decimate these times and uh, already cris railways uh, indian railways is using these time uh, for the time synchronization purpose the navic receiver for launch vehicle tracking more than uh, uh, one dozen of uh, launches we have flight tested these receivers to test for the accuracy so basically when the uh, uh, rocket goes uh, launches the satellite for the first time so in between the tracking information and the point of injection where it has actually launched the newly satellite that all information is available with the help of uh, navic receivers it is ruggedized and it supports the harsh dynamics of the flight the navic receiver for radio sound applications where basically this receiver is flown along with weather instruments in balloon and uh, you get the data and along with the precise position where uh, that data was recorded so these are some of the prototypes and you get very we are getting very good accuracy with these prototypes and the flight trials are on currently the differential navic receivers as mostly uh, for dgnss is the keyword now that for high accuracy application differential is required so we have tested along with navic and gps we have developed the prototype navic receivers and we are doing rtk and uh, post processing operations with uh, navic and we are getting very good accuracy results uh, in within sub sub meter ranges and uh, we, in in future we look forward for this uh, application to kick off in a big way and we will also uh, develop uh, industries uh, we will uh, have industries to join us in this endeavor navic in smartphone so like the second the, the major application for lbs where the mobile uh, phone requires uh, to have gnss 
so currently the B, uh, broadcom introduced the first chip dual frequency l1 l5 chips so we have uh, we have followed it up with them and now it supports navic l5 so mi8 was the first phone which supported navic and these are few of the screenshots and followed by a lot of many chips like from mediatek we have helio m3 and then from uh, broadcom uh, from qualcomm you have basically uh, the three models three chips were introduced uh, earlier this year you can see the 460 660 2 760 720g series of snapdragon processors so they all support navic now so the latest smartphones were redmi note 9 pro and re very recently mi 10i which is powered by 750g uh, snapdragon processor is also supported uh, uh, supports navic and by qualcomm these are some of the screenshots of navic based apps for mobile the first is the messaging receiver where we can decimate you can see the high wave alerts for uh, fishermen that fishermen are advised not to venture into the sea so these information directly can be decimated to the fishermen and other are the positioning apps these are some of the uh, receivers which we have deployed de deployed across india to support research and navigation some of the participants in this program are also beneficiary of this program then for coming on to the combined navigation and communication applications so isro also have communication satellites uh, we, which can uh, have uh, various applications so we have paired up the two the navic uh, basically and a navic receiver as well as the communication satellite so we have installed on a trial aircraft and you can see the left side is the navic receiver right side is the mss terminal or the communication terminal so you can basically have navigation with uh, navic and then you can transmit that position in real time via satellite i think i have a video for this these are some of the trial results you can see a very good accuracy we have got with navic this is the video where an aircraft flew from uh, kanpur airfield and we are able to track it in real time so this is a very good application you must have heard about ms370 where it was never retrieved so these type of applications are a new thing uh, and we, we can have that design for our future uh, aircrafts so similarly we had a, a, a boat tracking uh, application demonstrated live in mumbai and that led to a development of uh, basically coastal terminals for tracking small boats big ships are usually tracked but what about small boats so more than 2.5 lakh uh, fish uh, small boats ply in the indian uh, ocean region and to track them near the coasts uh, so more than uh, thousand boats are equipped with these terminals and we are able to track them similarly for uh, rail navigation you have basically the two applications automatic train tracking system for indian railways so it is proposed in more than 12000 trains and presently uh, it is there in many more locomotives as on a trial basis and uh, uh, and another is the warning system for unmanned level crossing so the first one you can see some of the field trial photographs where we have installed on uh, railways and you can have real time navigation using navic in uh, indian railways and uh, next i think yeah it's a small video for unmanned level crossing basically in india we have lot of unmanned level crossings so when the train approaches uh, that unmanned level crossing there are accidents to avoid that so as soon as the train comes and approaches the unmanned level crossing you can uh, trigger a siren or hooter and you can also schedule automatic opening and closing of the gates so this is the basically the uh, scheme of things of how that system works so this is for the indian railways and uh, this is the dat distress alert transmitter so many uh, this we can give to fisherman and he can issue sos alerts like uh, man overboard or sinking or fire so this is also being in, earlier it was with gps now we have incorporating it with navic also these are some of the navic uh, antennas which are developed uh, indigenously in sac and then uh, navic simulator like for developing an application or a receiver you need to have a simulator so currently very simulators are very uh, uh, in high cost and many people cannot afford them so we have developed a navic simulator also in house for testing these receivers navic in standards already in ais 140 vehicle tracking more than 100 devices are available and all public transport in india must support this then in nmea rinex then very recently in april 2020 navic has navic l5 has been included in rtcm 
10403.3 amendment 1 also for differential then in 3gpp also as told uh, in release 3 it will come and imo also uh, in, uh, approved for ocean water navigation in november 20 and other uh, uh, other also uh, standards we are in the process of uh, getting them incorporating in standards these are the published uh, documents available in our website the icd for uh, navic and the icd for uh, messaging applications so this you can download and have more information uh, i think i have exceeded my time thank you thank you very much thank you very much uh, we there are a few questions for you but we will ask them after the next presentation so now I would like uh, to ask um, Mr. Satoshi Koguri from Japan to talk about QZSS and its applications. Mr. Koguri, the floor is yours. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. And, uh, and we can now... see your slides. Uh, you can see my screen. Yeah, we okay. saw it, but it's black window now for for some reason. OK, now it's fine. OK. OK, first of all, I would like to the thanks uh, for uh, providing this great opportunity uh, to share uh, our satellite navigation system QGSS introduction. Among uh, participants. Now I'd like to start my presentation. OK, here we go. OK, so today I would like to the introduce to QGSS. The first of uh, its overview. I'd like to mention about the system and uh, program latest schedule and uh, current service and performances. And I'd like to the make uh, enhancement on uh, our uh, future uh, possibility to expand our navigation satellite system to Asia Pacific region. And briefly touch about application demonstration and summarizing uh, my presentation. OK. Uh, from this, this slide, I would like to mention about uh, our system uh, architecture. So, uh, yeah, as you may know, the, so the satellite navigation system has three major uh, uh, portions, uh, space segment and ground segment and user segment. So our cabinet office is uh, operating deploying so the satellite a space segment as well as ground control segment currently so the, uh, we have uh, four uh, orbiting satellites a uh, one geo satellite located in 127 uh, eastern uh, longitude and also three inclined geosynchronous orbit satellite a uh, drawing eight figure ground track uh, between the japan and australia we have two master control stations and seven uh, trunking and control stations in the uh, southwestern islands in Japan, and more than 30 monitoring stations around the world to uh, monitor the satellite as well as so that estimate uh, precise satellite orbit and track offset to create a navigation signal message. Uh, we have uh, three functional capabilities. Uh, the first one, GPS uh, complementary. Uh, it is uh, so the uh, lensing signals with uh, navigation message. And second one, second function is a GNSS augmentation. Uh, we will transmit uh, error corrections uh, from a satellite to uh, improve uh, GNSS uh, position accuracy. In addition, that these two uh, main uh, capabilities for the satellite navigation system, uh, we also have the messaging uh, services. Uh, it can be used for the disaster relief and the management operation. So we will cover Asia and the Pacific uh, region. 
uh, you can see the bottom of the slide. So the, this uh, uh, maps show you the so uh, our satellite navigation system coverage. One or more QGSS uh, space vehicles of a 10 degrees elevation angle. Uh, you can see this very uh, wide area uh, between the uh, Middle East and the uh, uh, middle of the Pacific Ocean. And this is uh, so the uh, latest uh, program uh, schedule. So uh, now uh, we are uh, preparing uh, so the next launch, uh, QGSS-1, the replacement uh, we called the one hour satellite. Uh, it will be launched in uh, so the, uh, 2021, uh, replaced of uh, first uh, satellite Michibiki. Uh, it was uh, 10 years uh, of design life, uh, was launched in uh, 2010. So yeah, they, it is almost uh, ending his uh, mission life uh, next year. So the uh, QGS Home World uh, will be launched. In addition, these four uh, satellite constellations uh, we are now uh, developing uh, three additional satellites for uh, seven satellite constellations. Around 2023 to 2024, so we will launch uh, these three additional satellites. This is uh, so the current uh, performance. So the, yeah, this is uh, so the signal in space uh, lensing accuracy. So that you can see the four uh, satellite uh, this URE, so that you can see that. So, yeah, our specification uh, 2.6 meters, 95 percent probability. So, all four satellite matched with this uh, so the uh, specification. We have two uh, so the augmentation service. So, the first one is a SRAS uh, submeter uh, level augmentation services. This is a sort of uh, purely a differential uh, GPS uh, services. Uh, we have 13 uh, reference stations in Japan. And so the uh, specification, the position accuracy, so the horizontal is 1.0 meters and vertically 2.0 meters. This is a sort of, yeah, uh, typical uh, sort of uh, result uh, of the on the, so the May 10, the 2018, 24 hours, so that in Okinawa Prefecture, so that we could get to the very good uh, the accuracy, the, so the 0.6 meters, why don't we? The other one is uh, the SHIRAS, the centimeter level augmentation services. So uh, we will use uh, SIRAS for the SIRAS, so uh, Japanese uh, the COAS network. Uh, so we are operating uh, more than 1,200 uh, uh, so the uh, COAS station in Japan. So uh, uh, continuous the observation uh, will be used for creating so uh, aerospheric and topospheric error corrections. Also, the, the orbit crack bias, the uh, error correction message. So the specification for this uh, augmentation service for the carrier phase positioning, so the less than 6.0 centimeter uh, static uh, positioning, uh, 12 centimeter for the read for the uh, kinematic application. This is uh, so the also recent uh, result. Uh, very uh, good accuracy or stably uh, so the uh, SIRAS positioning uh, can be used for the many kinds of applications in Japan. This is a so domestic service in Japan. And now we are uh, defining uh, so that our service requirement for future seven satellite construction. So the yeah we will have uh, so that new uh, function in open service uh, PMT uh, message, uh, navigation message authentication. 
as well as uh, we are uh, inc improving our uh, CCURI specification in the future, so the uh, 30 centimeters uh, in a step-by-step -step, uh, approach. So uh, we will adopt uh, new uh, technologies for uh, additional C satellites, uh, QGSS 5, 6, 7. Uh, we will equip uh, so the inter-satellite ranging as well as the two-way uh, ranging uh, between the, so the satellite and the ground uh, control segment. These two uh, new observables uh, will uh, improve uh, our uh, precise orbit determination, also uh, CCURE uh, range accuracy. And also, so the, for the augmentation services, uh, a current existing uh, so the domestic service uh, uh, will be uh, maintained in a future seven satellite constellation. In addition, these domestic uh, services, uh, we will uh, apply uh, so the Madoka-based PPT augmentation service. Uh, it is uh, so the yeah uh, a PPP. Uh, it will cover Asia Pacific region. Also, uh, messaging services. Uh, currently, we are providing uh, so the domestic uh, weather report, but in the future. Uh, we are trying to expand uh, this service into the Asia Pacific region. So I would like to uh, make a note. So uh, we are collaborating with the European Commission to create a common uh, early warning service uh, data format. Uh, this is uh, under ICG uh, correspondent group uh, activities. Uh, this is why I show you the so the uh, two our uh, carrier phase uh, augmentation services, uh, CRAS and uh, Madoka PPP. The CRAS is the domestic service. Uh, otherwise, so the uh, Madoka PPP uh, will cover a uh, very wide area in the QGSS coverage. So its operational service will start around 2023 at least at the latest, uh, with same uh, compact SSR format as CRS. The, this is a current uh, constellation design, so uh, we will have uh, three additional satellite. And its constellation provide uh, good uh, top uh, features. Uh, between the Japan and Australia, uh, including uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries. This is uh, so the visibility uh, from Tokyo. So the seven satellites uh, yeah, create a uh, better DOP. Also, this is the sort of visibility from other Asian cities, so Jakarta, Bangkok, and Singapore. So the uh, six satellite or seven satellite will be uh, observed uh, from these cities. Now we have already uh, started the procurement process for the three satellites. Now we are uh, um, uh, concluding its uh, the system design. Uh, just to start, uh, so the yeah, uh, right model production. And also we are uh, trying to uh, uh, complete uh, so the uh, ground control segment update uh, contract with um, our manufacturers. So. Uh, we are trying to uh, so uh, use our satellite navigation signals uh, for this this kind of uh, so the brand new applications. Uh, we are uh, we're thinking uh, so the the importance of uh, autonomous uh, control, the machine, and the uh, cars, and the uh, agricultural machine, and so on. 
So uh, we are developing uh, some uh, sort of specific uh, sort of model project uh, going to the sort of demonstration. And yeah, uh, previous presentation, the Indian colleagues, uh, the great, uh, excellent uh, sort of effort uh, to uh, create uh, sort of uh, chipset and receivers. So we also, yeah, are trying to uh, uh, get uh, sort of more uh, QGSS uh, truck uh, receivers chipset. So uh, most of the smartphone have already uh, sort of uh, capability to track the QGSS. So that now we are focusing uh, so that as a augmentation service, the Shiraz, uh, Madoka PPP, and uh, SRAS. So that, yeah, still uh, we are uh, trying to more effort to uh, spread this kind of uh, uh, receiver or equipment in the market. So a uh, list of the products that support uh, QGSS uh, is shown in the, this uh, URL. And before uh, closing uh, my presentation, I'd like to briefly touch on so the Mars GNSS Asia activity. So uh, it is an international uh, community uh, led by Japanese initiatives uh, and the ICG. So uh, we are promoting uh, a multiple constellation uh, utilization in the Asia Pacific region. So uh, this year, so uh, we are affected uh, so the COVID-19. Uh, so we are promoting uh, so some uh, uh, developing uh, uh, capacity building activities through uh, uh, remote internet. So one of major activities is uh, a uh, rapid prototype developing challenge. Uh, it is a program for young professionals and students. It's an idea competition with actual hardware, software design, development, and demonstration. So under collaboration, the cabinet office, MG, and uh, Thailand species and she just uh, Okay, so uh, QGSS is a Japanese regional navigation satellite system to improve not only GNSS availability, but also accuracy and reliability. So uh, we are providing uh, so the, uh, three uh, major uh, services, uh, PMT, uh, augmentation and messaging services since uh, November 1st, 2018. Now we are uh, deploying uh, seven satellite constellations. Uh, it will start uh, around 2023. So uh, we have already uh, started a procurement process. Uh, service requirements were established and uh, I'd like to enhance so, uh, our future uh, capability uh, for the augmentation and early warning service uh, into Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. So this is end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kogure. Um, well, we have a few questions here. I believe there are a few related to QZSS, but I see that my colleagues from Japan have already them answered in the chat. Uh, there are few questions um, on related to Galilea. Uh, Dominique, um, could you please answer the questions? Uh, there is the question e-call services. E-call services is available in America. OK, so uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, it's so E112 is very similar to E911, which is the US system. Uh, eCall is a system designed especially for use in cars. Now, I don't know whether European cars, if they're exported to the US, would have eCall enabled. It's quite possible that it would. I don't know for sure. But certainly when you make an emergency call, 
in the US, your location data is uh, sent to the emergency services. So I, I think it's possible it could work, but I, I can't say for sure. OK, thank you. Uh, another question also related to Galileo. What is the expected accuracy around the East Africa when using mm -hmm. Galileo constellation only for positioning? OK, so it's more or less what you'll get anywhere in the world. So if you've got a, a standalone receiver, you'll get accuracy down to around one meter. We are seeing about one meter uh, with, a, with good conditions. So that means if you've got good visibility of the sky, uh, there's no buildings in the area that to give you multipath. So in good conditions, you'll get around one meter accuracy with a standalone receiver. OK, thank you. Um, there is um, another question which is um, more general. If anyone would like of the speakers to answer, is it possible to use GNSS positioning for the visible side of the moon? Maybe I can answer that because we're also involved in, in that activity along with NASA. So ESA and NASA have been working together on developing what we call the space service volume. So it's to define an area around the Earth that it possibly extends as far as the moon to provide GNSS coverage, a limited coverage. We know that NASA has a mission uh, with ESA to send a GNSS receiver to the vicinity around the moon that will be using the GNSS signals really at their most extreme level. Uh, if you can imagine that on the Earth when you receive a GNSS signal, it's at a very low level. It's actually below, below the noise floor. And so uh, CDMA technology is used to pull that signal out of the what is essentially background noise. So if you take that out to the distance of the moon, then you really have extremely low signal levels. I don't think they have a receiver yet at the moon, but in principle, they're, they're planning um, a tests in the future that will try to see whether it's possible to receive the GNSS signals on the moon. I know it's, uh, I think the, the record is something like uh, 100,000, maybe 150, maybe 200,000 kilometers from the Earth with a with a, a receiver, a space, a space qualified receiver. But as yet, I don't think it's possible to pick it up on the moon, but we'll, we'll, we'll find out in the next uh, year or so. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dominic. Hello, Hello Shafa. This is Dines. Yeah. So before we move further, so I think uh, Mr. Kogre has another meeting at 5 p.m. So we thank, thank him for his uh, very informative uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Mr. Kogure, and thank you for your time. I, I believe our colleagues from Japan will answer questions if they are related to, to QZSS. Thank yes. you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the Dennis and the please answer. So the, yeah. <laughs> OK, I'll very, try my many best. Question. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank uh, you for with audience. regard thank to you the question Shafa. related to the, uh, to the moon and, and an SSV, so as I referred in my presentation, there is this uh, publication of ICD, it's first edition. It is on the website, so I would suggest uh, those who are interested in this topic um, read the, through that, that publication. It's really very interesting reading. Also, we are now working the, the ICD working group dealing with this matter, they are working on the second edition of this publication and it will be made available on our website once it is um, finalized. Um, well, there is also kind of the general question um, is the, the question is, does the satellites have S to N data? Anyone can comment on this question? Well, I don't want to hog the uh, hog the discussion, but uh, nobody else has jumped in. So the signal to noise data is available from your smartphone if you've got the appropriate application running. I know in Android there are applications that can pull out the the raw data from the the chipset and uh, use that for 
a few more analyses that you can you can set running on your Android device. I, I don't know if there's an equivalent uh, signal to noise um, or a, a, a low level raw data uh, app application for for iPhone. Maybe someone else uh, has knowledge on that. But I know it's possible with an, an Android device. Yeah. Any our colleagues from India can also comment on this question? Yes, uh, as uh, pointed out, uh, the this data is available as uh, CBA and not plots in um, receiver GUIs and the chipset uh, in NMEA GSV messages uh, give this data and it is uh, as a standard in NMEA stream this is available. OK, thank you. Um, OK, I think um, we covered more or less all the questions which have been in chat. As I said, some of them have been also already answered. Some of them, there is the question related to Ryanx format. I believe that's uh, how mm -hmm. for Ryanx mm -hmm. file, uh, files. This, I think, will be covered in okay. the coming days. Or Dinesh, mm -hmm. would you like to say anything? Yeah. Uh, I think there are a few questions related with the PPP. Yeah. Actually, we'll be going details about this PPP or Madoka, maybe also tomorrow, tomorrow a little bit on the theory, and also the after tomorrow. So we'll talk during that time, what are the file formats and how they are broadcasted and all. So you will see the, all the technical details tomorrow. And if you really need more, quite deep into the technical, so I'll find some reference materials published by QGSS. Uh, we have a uh, Madoka and CLAS, two different types of signals, so that will prepare the reference materials as well, because also uh, I myself don't know all the these technical details. There are so many things, but we can prepare uh, some reference materials for you and probably we can get more materials from Galileo as well if uh, these technical materials or already Dominic uh, gave you the reference, the IS documents. So we need to check those documents to find out the formats, how they are broadcasted and all. So that's one thing. And uh, but some questions, I'm not sure what is this about, for example, how for Rhinox files. So what is this related with? Uh, but we can discuss uh, all these I mean, more technical things during the exercise tomorrow. We have the four hours to discuss all these issues and also on day three. And as far as I remember this, uh, yeah, SN, the SN, so probably this is related with the signal to noise ratio and, uh, and the receiver, we have the carrier to noise ratio. So sometimes it's a little bit confusing about SNR and CN0. It's uh, I think we are a bit different for me. It's not they are different, but some people they quite commonly use uh, SNR for CN0. So uh, the CN0 we can measure in the receiver, they output the CN0, but the SNR you have to uh, get uh, just outside uh, after the, uh, the AGC, I suppose. Uh, we, we can get uh, some receivers, they provide this data, but not all. And what Dominic mentioned that uh, like the, uh, the Android or some the, some specific uh, mobile phones now they are outputting this SNR value, which is a bit different from the CN0. Also, we can talk on this on day three if we, you, you have more interest on that, or we can see how these values uh, look like. Okay. On the Thank mobile you. phone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is another question to you, uh, Dominique, again. Any information on height accuracy while using Galilea constellation? Uh, height accuracy, so it's it's very similar to uh, the, um, the one meter um, accuracy that I mentioned for positioning. Um, obviously with height, you've, you've got slightly lower or slightly inferior geometry because you're not seeing the satellites on the other side of the earth so probably around under two meters i would say for for height accuracy okay 
Thank you. There is the, the note from, from Renato Filier from Croatia. Mm -hmm. He said that collection of GNSS pseudo ranges is related to Android um, uh, app. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. it does not uh, relate to iPhones. However, GSA raw GNSS task force mm. maintains yeah. a database of collected raw GNSS pseudo ranges. Yeah. Interesting parties may contact um, Renato for for details so if you mm. have any interest please send emails to us and we will forward them to to renata mm. yeah. um i see shafa there's another question about beacons for uh compatible beacons and i think probably yeah. when i was talking yeah. about the search and rescue yes. service so um so essentially all all cospa sarsat beacons that can transmit on the 406 megahertz emergency distress frequency can be picked up by the, the Galileo Search and Rescue Service. Um, the, the, the actual relay of that signal to the, the, the emergency rescue services depends on the local uh, facilities. So in Europe, I mentioned we have three, three ground stations that pick up the emergency distress signals transmitted by the satellites back down to the Earth. So it depends whether there's a, um, a rescue center coordinating the, the the signals in in that region but as I, as I did say that there are there are centers around around the earth so some areas we offer better coverage than others but it does depend on whether you have a um, what we call a meo lut installed in a, an area that's covered by the satellite yeah but um, the beacons themselves they are they're all compatible Yes, um, and another question for a uh, question for you, Dominique. Are Samsung phones having Galileo applications embedded? Almost certainly, yes. Um, Samsung uh, adopted the Qualcomm chipsets very early on, um, and I think even their own chipsets are Galileo enabled. Whether they have the dual frequency capability is another matter. Uh, I know some of the, the high, higher end devices do and I think one of the, the presenters from India mentioned that the latest uh, Qualcomm chipsets I think the 460 the the, the 662 and the 750g they were all um, they all had the Navic uh, L5 uh, signal capability so if they have L5 for Navic then they would almost certainly have Galileo capabilities as well, dual frequency, because they would all, all, almost certainly cover the L1 frequency. So Samsung devices, yes, I think there's a very high likelihood that they will be Galileo enabled. OK, thank you, Dominique. Uh, OK. The, test your smartphone. All right. Um, so that's, I think, it mm. for, for now. Uh, okay. We will have a break until um, 8.50 UTC time okay. and we will meet at 8.50 for the next session which will be on high accuracy data processing requirements and our colleagues from European Space Agency, India and Japan will uh, brief us on, on this uh, topic. Well, thank you very much and we will see you in, in 8.50. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after 40 minutes. Yeah. Thank you, bro. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, we will continue our um, session. It is now about high accuracy data processing requirements. And our first speaker is Mr. Daniel Blansky from European Space Agency. He will talk about Galileo High Accuracy Service. Daniel, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for um, introducing me briefly. Um, my name is Daniel Blonsky. I am a system engineer in the uh, uh, Directorate of Navigation in the European Space Agency. And I'm also supporting ICG as a, a co-chair for the working group B on enhancements of uh, DNSS performance, new services and capabilities. Um, I have uh, prepared a few slides introducing you to the Galileo High Accuracy Service. 
um, this uh, set of slides has been prepared together with uh, I hope you can see the slides just one one second. Now you should now you should be able to see uh, my yes. slides. Just yes, we see your yeah. slides in the presentation mode. Thank you, Daniel. OK. Um, so this um, set of slides has been prepared together with. Uh, and is from the European Commission. I'm going to give you a brief. Um, we will briefly talk about uh, target user markets before uh, I show you the characteristics of the service, its targets, and give you a brief description of the high level architecture the generation of the service requires, <clears throat> and introduce you also to some initial performance predictions um, for the Galileo High Accuracy Service. Um, I think Dominic has already presented. Um, parts of that slide, so I will be very brief. Um, Galileo is providing services since uh, four years now, uh, among which is the Galileo Open Service, which uh, provides very good availability and very good ranging accuracy. And there has been questions before on the positioning accuracy achievable with Galileo um, Open Service. You see on the bottom right, uh, you see a, a scatter plot of position fixes of several stations which are distributed around the world and you can see that 95 percent of the position fixes are within one meter and 75 centimeters and indeed as dominic explained the typical position fix uh, is in the order of below one meter uh, one sigma so galileo is providing very good positioning performance already um, especially when uh, users exploit the dual frequency capability. However, for some applications, this is not uh, sufficient. And Galileo has been designed to allow for the provision of a commercial service, which was intended to broadcast value added data, uh, such as high accuracy uh, data and also authentication features. Um, in March 2018, it has been decided by the European Commission to provide the high accuracy feature free of charge to Galileo users. Uh, so the Galileo high accuracy service will be free of charge to Galileo users on the E6 uh, signal. And it shall enable users to exploit uh, precise point positioning techniques in order to allow innovation in emerging markets but also in consolidated markets and the objectives of the service have been defined to minimize as far as possible disruptions on existing um, um, business models of established providers so you will see some differences of this high accuracy service from high accuracy services which are provided really commercially at the this high accuracy service will be rolled out in several stages. In uh, phase zero, which is a testing, which has started last year and is continuing uh, this year as well, which allows us to test the signal, allows us to test also the dissemination capabilities for the corrections and even initial um, uh, tests based on those signals um, to less to derive lessons learned for the next steps in developing the high accuracy service. This phase zero is followed by the high accuracy initial service, which will mainly target the European coverage uh, and will enable uh, precise point positioning 
with uh, performances very much close to those of the final service, um, but focused on European territory. And then phase two, which is the full high accuracy service. This will be um, consisting of two service levels. Service level one, which is a global service, which will provide 20 centimeters horizontal and 40 centimeters vertical accuracy within a convergence time of five minutes that users can reach this um, accuracy. This will be complemented by a service level two provided to European users, uh, which will essentially achieve the same accuracy target, but will uh, allow to achieve this accuracy much faster within 100 seconds. So factor three faster than service level one. Um, the intended target markets without going into much detail for this high accuracy service range from geomatics, agriculture, road applications, rail applications, even aviation applications down to consumer solutions. So it's a very wide range of possible usage of the Galileo high accuracy service. Before going into more uh, details on the service, I think it's also worth to recall a bit what is precise point positioning at a very high level. I think you will go into more detail in later presentations. Um, if you look at the classical way of, of uh, positioning using the standard positioning services, you will receive navigation messages from the uh, GNSS satellites. You will apply them uh, in your receiver and derive your position fix. This allows you to reach meter level, several meters of, of, of accuracy. Um, in order to improve this, there are basically two types of techniques. One is differential, which is um, more classical. You have a reference station at the known location. And because you know the location, you can compute positioning errors of this uh, reference station and use this to derive corrections for users which are close to this reference station. So this is differential techniques. It's uh, similar to RTK. So you get these mess these corrections on your user receiver, apply them to your position fix, and you can increase the accuracy you obtain. Of course, um, these signals which you receive from the GNSS satellites are um, affected by several user, uh, several error sources. Some of them are more coming from the system like orbit and clock errors and, and signal biases. So the, the information you get from the navigation message in, Gal in case of Galileo, the FNAF, the orbits have a certain accuracy and the clock predictions have a certain accuracy which allow you to achieve meter level performance, but you need to have additional information to go to the centimeter and decimeter level performance. So these system contributions um, can be measured and can be um, corrected. In addition, the signals are also affected by atmospheric uh, disturbances like uh, ionospheric delays and tropospheric delays, which also can be observed. And then uh, finally, very close to the receiver itself, there are effects in the user environment like multipath or even inside the receiver uh, which introduce errors to uh, your measurements. So those are very difficult from a system side to observe and to, to correct for. However, in uh, for precise point positioning, basically what, what is done instead of providing you corrections on your observation, the corrections are provided on your uh, with respect to the navigation messages, so you get corrections on the orbit information, you get corrections on the clock information, which allow you to start PPP, and you get to DC meter level positioning performance with a relatively long convergence time of uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Adding additional information on the, on the signal biases, so code and phase biases, allow you to resolve what is called ambiguities of the phase measurement. And this 
allows you to achieve much better accuracy. However, the convergence time is only slightly improved with respect to classical PPP. In order to improve really also convergence, what is required is additional information on atmospheric delays, mainly the ionosphere. So this kind of information enable different types of techniques on PPP. Um, in Galileo, those corrections will be transmitted through an open format in the E6P signal. Um, there is a message definition already available for the initial high accuracy service. However, it is not yet in the public domain. The format is uh, similar to the compact SSR, but it has been adapted, of course, to the uh, specific characteristics of the Galileo E6P channel. In general, the following parameters for the two service levels are envisaged. So for the global service level, orbit corrections, clock corrections, and bias information to enable uh, PPP and PPP ambiguity uh, resolution techniques. And for the regional level, additional ionospheric corrections are provided in order to allow fast PPP to uh, get to a very low convergence times. In addition to those core parameters, there are of course further uh, message contents under consolidation like quality indicators, flags and so on, which will be all uh, published in a HAS uh, signal in space ICD. These corrections allow basically the definition of the two service levels. So here you have a summary of the key features of this two service levels. Service level one, global service with an accuracy of 20 centimeters horizontal and 40 centimeters vertical. Uh, the high accuracy data corrections for Galileo PS signals and on the global level, you should be able to converge within 300 seconds. So this is service level one. And for the service level two, essentially the same features, just improved convergence. Uh, users of the high accuracy service will also be supported by a user help desk uh, provided by the Galileo Service Center. Now, in order to generate these corrections, um, of course, you need to monitor the GNSS signals. So here you have a high level uh, view of the of the architecture. So you see on top the GNSS satellites broadcasting signals. Those signals are observed at uh, reference stations, global, globally distributed and more dense regionally distributed stations. These data are then processed in a, a high accuracy mission center, which provides corrections to the Galileo ground segment for uplink to Galileo satellites and broadcast to users in E6. And in parallel, uh, these corrections will also be provided through the internet to users connected. So users um, using these corrections together with the Galileo open service uh, signals and the GPS signals will be able to obtain very good accuracy in uh, good convergence time. The uh, effect a ground network or the reference receiver network has on the uh, end user performances is illustrated on that slide. So you see two different net one with a few number of stations and one with a higher number of stations. You can see that the fewer station network has uh, very few receivers in the Asian region. So if you compare a user in Malaysia, which has been chosen for this case, to a user in Europe, which where the network is very dense, you can see that the Asian user would suffer from a number of disruptions and spikes in the position uh, position fixes. By just 
increasing the density of the network also in this region, you can see that this uh, position fixes become much more stable and much more uh, it's suffering very from very few spikes only and also the accuracy is improved. So this is just to illustrate that it's not only about user receiver, it's also about the quality of the corrections which then depend on um, the network which is used to observe the uh, GNSS signals. Now, it, what does it mean to the user? If the user is receiving Galileo signals, you here on this slide I have two plots. The upper plot shows you the convergence after a start of the receiver in the horizontal domain. So you see on the blue curve, this is Galileo only dual frequency uh, with corrections for orbit and clock in addition to the INAF. Then you see uh, the Galileo only in light blue um, with uh, orbit clock and bias information which allows to do ambiguity fixing. So you reach the uh, performance target faster and then Adding on top the ionospheric information, you can see that this convergence is even faster in the horizontal domain. So the continuous lines are for Galileo only, and then similar you see for Galileo and GPS, so multi-constellation fixes, you see that the accuracy and also the convergence improves if you add more satellites to your solution. And the same is for plot, you can see here is for the vertical, Convergence, so you see that the vertical solution takes a bit longer to uh, converge to the desired target accuracy, but with adding more information, providing more information on the signal, um, the convergence can be reduced. So the convergence time at user level depends on one side on the quality of the corrections, what is the error of these corrections, the residual error, what is the age of those corrections. It also depends on the technique applied by the user, whether it's more, um, more classical uh, PPP or whether it allows ambiguity fixing or whether it is fast PPP. It also depends on the number of corrected satellites in the local geometry. And as you can see, the challenge for the convergence is basically with a vertical solution, which um, with the corrections, is um, within 300 seconds for the service level um, one P PPP AR for the global service and within 100 seconds for the service level two. Of course, uh, Galileo is not the only uh, system which is intending to provide a high accuracy service, but Galileo has has, uh, will be the first global free of charge high accuracy service. Here you have a slide which has been presented at the ICG 14 um, last year on interoperability of precise point positioning services provided by the main constellation providers. And uh, you can see that there are several um, PPP services under discussion, under development, and uh, you see also Galileo is a global service with an open format. It will provide Galileo and GPS corrections and will enable PPP on a global scale. Just to wrap up a bit, the takeaway from this presentation is that Galileo will provide a high accuracy service which will enable 20 centimeter, 40 centimeter positioning on a global scale free of charge to Galileo users. It will be transmitted openly for free through an open standard format. The high accuracy service will be gradually rolled out uh, with capabilities that will evolve with user expectations. And if you want to in, in get more information on the Galileo high accuracy service, you can find documentation on the GNSS Service Center, so you have the web links here. 
there's the um, Galileo E6B C code technical note already published on this web page. And if you're interested in applications, there is also the market and technology reports of the GSA and user needs document. So this information can be found on the web pages. Thank you very much and back to the moderator. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, we have a few minutes. Um, could you please answer this question? What vertical datum the Galileo uses? Does it use the GeoID? Uh, Galileo uses the uh, uh, Galileo terrestrial reference frame, and this is linked to the international terrestrial reference frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. The another question is, uh, PPP service is a service mm -hmm. that provides extra correction information through the satellites. Mm -hmm. Yes, in, indeed, yeah. the PPP okay. service will, uh, the HUS will provide additional information through the E6 signal to complement the uh, open service signals of Galileo and GPS. And also these corrections will be provided through a terrestrial interface, yes. Okay, so what is the open standard format for HAS data? <laughs> um, so as I, as I explained, the uh, ICD itself is not yet published, so the interface document is not yet in the public domain, but it is linked to the compact SSR format, which has been discussed also in, in the RTCM context. So this will be basically published as soon as um, the service uh, declaration is ongoing, you will see the G service center webpage providing this information. So it will be okay. published openly. Yeah, thank you. Um, what is the estimated time of observation for each PPP, PPPR and fast PPP? Um, I think it's, um, maybe I haven't been very clear. It's uh, the, the trick is the convergence after you start your receiver. And this is uh, for classical PPP 20 to 30 minutes to reach a converged solution. Uh, for PPPAR, it's uh, only slightly faster. And for the fast PPP, it is in the order of uh, minutes. So 100 seconds to five minutes. This is basically mm -hmm. the, the convergence. Yeah, and another question. Um, do you have any references for the PPP? Um, I'm sure that there are plenty of references also, which will be presented later on by, by uh, Dinesh. OK, all right. Yeah, otherwise um, I can, I can uh, if people are interested, just drop me an email and I try to point out okay. by email. Yeah, the, um, you, you can see the um, the email address of Daniel in his last slide. Also, once we finish all the sessions for today, we will publish all these presentations on the website and all the invited participants will get linked to, to those presentations. Um, does the receiver need to have PPP capability to use this PPP technology? So the cost of receiver should be more, more expensive. Um, essentially, in order to benefit from this technology, there's a specific processing uh, or user algorithm which needs to be implemented. So yes, there is some more uh, processing effort required. And you need, of course, a receiver which either can retrieve correction through a terrestrial interface or through the E6. So this is also another aspect for the receiver to be um, supporting. OK, thank you. And there is one more question, but it might require maybe a little bit more time. Is that the? Could you please talk a little bit more about the geoid uh, in Galilee? It's not really clear. Um, unfortunately, I can't. But I will take this question back, and if mm -hmm. uh, you send me an email, I will try to provide uh, corresponding information. Yeah. Okay. So Bruno, please send the email to to Daniel. I think that's all uh, the questions which I see in the chat. Thank you again, uh, Daniel. Um, we will move to yeah.
we will move now to our next um, speaker. The presentation will be about Navic position errors and it will be made by our colleague from India, Mr. Anand Dvivedi. Anand, good please, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. yeah, good morning, Madam Shafa. I'm in uh, Dr. Philip place. So I'll be oh, presenting okay. from here, if that is okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Daniel, could you please um, switch off your your screen? Should be okay now, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, whether my uh, presentation is visible? Yes, we see your presentation. Thank you. Okay. And then very good morning to all the colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon to all the colleagues. I'll be presenting on the Navic position error. Uh, my name is Anand and I'm working in a satellite navigation program office at URL Satellite Center, ISRO, Bangalore, India. The content of uh, my presentation is listed here. Basically, I'll just introduce about the Navic, which uh, more or less everybody is aware of. So it's a redundant slide. Then I'll be talking about the GNSS accuracy and error definition in the simplest term and the performance of Navic in four parts of India, Northern region, Southern region, Western region and Eastern region. Then there will be comparison of horizontal versus vertical error in these regions. As far as IRNSS or NAVIC is concerned, the IRNSS stands for Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System. I guess this is already covered by Dr. Philip already. The service area of within India and its island and area bounded by the latitude of 5 degrees south to 50 degree north and longitude 55 degree east to 110 degree east. One uh, small update that the future satellite of the NAVIC will be having additional L1 band service in addition to the existing L5 and S band. Uh, I try to simplify the error definition of GNS accuracy as was instructed. So in the simplest form, what I have, I am going to present that the position error, whatever uh, is used in this presentation is defined as the position error compromising of standard deviation components of all the three directions east west north south and vertical and normally it is represented with means in my presentation it is represented with two sigma 95 percent but normally as per the definition also it is represented with two sigma numbers uh, as far as directional error is concerned it is uh, 2d rms directional error in the sense it can be in horizontal plane or in vertical plane if it is defined for the horizontal plane, it will be treated as a HP horizontal position error. If it defined in the vertical plane, it will be treated as vertical position error. Again, it is represented in two sigma number. Uh, another uh, interesting definition is for the CP as it represents a circle centered with the true position of the receiver or the user antenna where it is located with the CP radius. It's uh, interested, uh, actually this is very interesting for the surface user because it talks about only horizontal position with the 50% probability. So it's mainly for the surface users. And uh, other is dilution of precision. The dilution of precision or DOP uh, provides a simple characterization of the user satellite geometry as uh, larger DOP represent poor satellite geometry and bad position error, whereas the smaller DOP represent very good satellite geometry and better position error. These, this is the methodology, how we have taken the data and how we process and where, which are the area, as I already told, the northern region, southern region, western region and eastern region of the India are uh, used for the collection of the data and the monthly data was collected and analyzed for the 3D RMS position error, horizontal position error, comparison between horizontal and vertical position error, CEP and dilution of precision. 
this is the i am uh, covering the northern region performance so for the northern region the cp what we uh, achieved is 1.93 meter this is a graph on the right side is very interesting because it uh, talks about the error in latitude is higher than the error in longitude the sole reason is our longitudinal separation of the satellite is very good in comparison to the latitude and uh, that can be reflected that can be seen here but as the cp for the northern region is 1.93 meters this is the dop of uh, northern region place and p dop and s dop both are uh, represented the blue color is representing the on the left side graph blue color is representing the minimum dop the green one is average and the yellow one is the maximum so the p dop average value is 3.8 approximately and s dop is 2.3 and the horizontal position error we have achieved is around 4 meter occasionally it has gone beyond 5 also but more or less it is in and around 4 meters in the northern region this is this right side plot is for the 30 days hpe or horizontal position error each bar represent one day two sigma values the this is the total position error in the sense three left side graph is 3d rms position error in the northern northern region and we can see it's a, more or less centered around 9 meter sometime it goes beyond also but more or less it is in around 9 meter the very interesting graph is on the right side this compares the vp and hp component of the errors the green is represent the green is the representation for hpe the red is the representation for the vpe the y axis talks about the number of sample for a monthly data and uh, x axis talks about the error in terms of meters so what we could see the vp is having more components for the higher error whereas hp is concentrated toward lower error values the similar values for the southern region it's very similar to northern region we have seen the cp of 1.95 meters and again latitude error is more than the longitude error the dop values are stated like this 3.7 for the p dop and s dop is 1.8 hp is very similar to the northern region around 4 meters again the p is 9 meter position error is 9 meter which is represented in left side graph for the 30 days value each bar represent one day and right side is again the comparison of hp vp for the southern region it's again more concentrated hp is again more concentrated for the lower error values whereas vp is uh, slightly on the higher as well as lower error values the performance of western region cp is slightly higher than the southern and northern region and we are seeing approximately 2.27 meter in compared to 1.9 around for the northern and southern region for the cp this could be the reason of the s band interference these all graphs are for the dual frequency and the dop wise there is no change 3.8 and 2.3 meter for the p dop and s dop average dops and hp is around 5 meters and hp graph is on the right side each again each bar represent one day for the continuous 30 days then the position error is around 10 meters and left side graphs uh, is 30 days position error for the western region right side graph is again comparison of horizontal and vertical position errors here we can see the horizontal error is little more propagated in terms of the higher component error if you compare with the other graph of the northern and southern region this is the performance of navic in eastern region here we have seen cs interference in s band and the cp is also increased from the 1.9 or 2 to 2.89 meters and error in latitude is higher in terms of the in comparison to the error in longitude the performance navic in terms of dop is 3.9 and 2.4 this is the average value of p dop and s dop which is given in left side graph and hp is higher in comparison to the other region whereas we have seen 5 meter around uh, hp or horizontal position in other part of the india here we are get, getting approximately 7 meters and the position error is approximately 12 meter whereas other part of the india it is less than 
so this this uh, also is little higher in the eastern region for all the, almost all the 30 days we can see it is going beyond 10 and approximately centered around 12 meters and the uh, horizontal component and vertical component both are having more value towards the higher rf for the eastern region so in, this is the summary of the position uh, performance elevation result the navi position error throughout the indian region is approximately 10 meter apart from of course eastern region which is slightly 10 to 12 meters the eastern region is having slightly higher position error compared to other parts of the india the worst case cp is always less than 3 meter throughout the service area we have computed in all parts of india and it is always less than 3 meters the vp is having more number of points to a higher error compared to hp which is nominal for the error distribution and the satellite navigation program we are uh, regularly monitoring the navic performance and the performance evaluation report can be found and this is the open website for the isro headquarters website uh, link is given so anybody interested to have the quarterly performance evaluation report can uh, see this link and regular update on the navic position error can be obtained from the link so that's it from my side i'll be happy to answer any question if there thank you very much um, there is the question um, what is the reason sorry what is the just a second what is the reason behind the higher s band interference in western region of india uh, that uh, we are looking into what is the reason that could be other genus of service provider uh, frequency interference as well as there could be it's open by max band and that could be local uh, wi-fi band interference also we are mm -hmm. still in the process of analyzing that is why we are uh, regularly monitor our performance in alpha and as both the bands uh, but mostly it could be the interference. Understand. Um, another question: What datum Navic is using? Sorry. What datum, horizontal or vertical, Navic is using? Reference system is WGS84. You could write a question uh, by mail. I'll love to reply to that. Okay. Okay. So. Um, this question is from Raj. Uh, could you please send your question to us by email and we will forward it to our colleagues in India so that they can reply you later. Thank you very much. Well, I don't see any questions uh, right now. Uh, there is one more question. Why is the error stretched more in latitude than latitude, uh, longitude in the SA uh, CEP? Yeah, as I explained during the presentation, our satellites are widely apart in longitude direction, 55 to 120, uh, 32.5 to 129. It is separated in longitude direction. Whereas uh, if you see our GSO is inclined only 29 degrees. So the separation in longitude direction is much higher than the latitude direction. This, this is just because of the DOP is getting better in terms of the uh, uh, error in uh, latitude. So that is why we are having more error in latitude or north south, whereas less error in terms of the east west. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank um, you. Ma so we will move to our next presentation. It will be made by also our colleague from India, uh, Mr. Gan Shyam, and he will talk about Navic S band signal performance. Please, Mr. Shian, the floor is yours. Yeah, good afternoon, ma'am. I am going to uh, upload my presentation. Yeah, uh, are you able to see my presentation? Yes, we do see your presentation. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Gan Shyam. Uh, from URF Satellite Center, Bangalore. Uh, it's a uh, ISRO uh, center. So uh, today I am going to uh, present the S band performance of Navic. ITU has allocated uh, the frequency band between 2483.5 megahertz to 
and 2500 uh, MHz for radio navigation satellite system in S band. In all the three regions, the diagram is shown here. Presently, uh, Navic and B2 provides the navigation service in S band, and the Galileo is uh, has a plan to introduce navigation signal in S band. In this slide, I am going to explain about the S band interface. Broadly, I have classified the interference in uh, two uh, parts. The first is interference between the system uh, and network in RNSS, or uh, I, I can say that it's a uh, in-band interference. And the second uh, is the terrestrial interference. Uh, that is the uh, various types of other services which are being offered in the S-band. Actually, ITU has allocated this S band from 2.4 GHz to 2.5 GHz for various types of services, which is given in the uh, table below. Uh, the uh, in band interference uh, between the RNSS system was presented uh, during ICG 14 by yeah. India. In the, in the next slide, I am going to briefly explain about uh, the in band interference. So uh, here uh, you can see my, uh, means, uh, this uh, to study the interference analysis, we have uh, collected navigation data in L5 band and S band uh, for uh, across India from south to north and west to east from different stations. You can see the top left uh, uh, C bar and not plot. The X axis represent the uh, 28 na uh, days navigation data were collected. And the y axis is the uh, receive CR and not in dv hertz. So uh, the plot clearly explained that for the uh, from south to north and east to west, the data collected, uh, the peak to peak uh, variation between the received CR and not is around 2 dv hertz. Whereas if you concentrate on the right side plot uh, for the S band uh, signal, uh, the data uh, collected from the southern part of India is showing the CR and not is around 51 dB hertz, uh, whereas uh, for that uh, northern part and eastern part of India, the CR and not is around uh, 58 dB hertz. So it clearly indicates that the CR and not variation is around 4 to 5 dB hertz uh, in S band uh, uh, signal in comparison to the 2, band, 2 dB hertz in L5 band. This data is shown here for INSS 1C. The similar observations were reported in uh, all other uh, satellite also. I have given the reference. It was presented during ICG 14. So in this slide, uh, mainly I'm going to talk about the uh, terrestrial interference that is uh, out of band interference. So the table here uh, highlights all the applications being offered in this uh, out of band means 2.4 gigahertz to 2.4835 gigahertz. <clears throat> I'm uh, briefly uh, given the uh, details of all the services being offered. So first is the wireless network uh, devices. This operates between 2.4 gigahertz to 2.5 gigahertz uh, using the 14 different channels. But in India, channel number one to channel number 13 are operational. That is from 2.4 gigahertz to 2.4835 gigahertz. The second service is the Bluetooth, which also operate in the same frequency band. Uh, the Bluetooth 5.0 uh, uh, is having a bandwidth of 2 megahertz, slightly narrower bandwidth in, in comparison to the Wi-Fi network. And the classical Bluetooth are having a 1 megahertz bandwidth. Uh, the other uh, devices such as Wi-Fi peripherals, radio control, car alarm, uh, microwave, ovens, and the wireless charging, all are operating in the same frequency band. Uh, in this uh, work, I have uh, carried out the interference between Wi-Fi network and uh, Bluetooth devices to the INSS as band signal. So this slide presents the uh, test setup uh, <clears throat> used for the carrying out the interference analysis. The top uh, diagram, uh, top right diagram shows that uh, setup for the uh, Wi-Fi routers uh, and the bottom diagram shows that um, uh, interference is study using the mobile devices. <clears throat> so the uh, steps followed were first uh, we have placed the Wi-Fi router uh, close to the receiver antenna 
approximately around two feet away. Then we have configured the Wi-Fi uh, router uh, on channel number from one to channel 13. Then uh, the data were transferred between two devices using the Wi-Fi routers. And the, during that time, we have recorded the uh, receiver data. And after some time, we have moved the Wi-Fi router around 15 feet away and we have repeated the exercise uh, uh, shown in step one to step four. Similarly, for Bluetooth devices, we have used two mobile phones uh, having a Bluetooth 5.0 and uh, kept near the receiver antenna and uh, performed the file transfer and they recorded the navigation data for the duration. Here, I, I would like to I would like to highlight that for uh, Bluetooth devices, we have not explored the channel options. The specifications of the Wi-Fi routers and GNSS receiver used for this analysis is shown here. So in this slide, I am going to present the result of interference analysis uh, due to Wi-Fi routers on uh, Navic S-band signal. The plot shown here is for INSS 1C uh, satellite. The, the x-axis shows the time in second and y-axis shows the received CRM not in dB hertz. The, the top plot shows that uh, performance when the uh, Wi-Fi router was kept close to the uh, receiver antenna <clears throat> and different channels were configured. You can see that first channel number one were selected in Wi-Fi router and the degradation due to Wi-Fi router to the Navic uh, S-band signal is around 3 to 4 dB Hertz. Subsequently, when we switch to channel number six, it can be seen that their degradation has slightly increased to 4 to 5 dB Hertz. And when we switch to channel number eight, it was around 4 dB Hertz. And uh, when we switch to channel number 10 and higher, the, the down plot here uh, is showing uh, two different uh, uh, plots. First, the green uh, square box shows when the router is kept near to that uh, antenna. And the second is when the router is kept uh, 15 feet away. You can see that channel number 11 and channel number 13 in continuation to the top observation as we move from channel 1 to channel 13, the degradation has continuously increased from around 3 to 4 dB hertz to 17 dB hertz for channel number 13. The maximum degradation is seen in channel number 13. And when we moved from uh, receiver antenna around 15 feet, the degradation has slightly reduced, but uh, still uh, it, it was uh, present. So similarly, this exercise we have carried for Bluetooth also. Uh, so when the Bluetooth data was getting transferred, you can see in the plot, the plot is also for INSS 1C satellite. The x-axis shows time in second and y-axis shows uh, the received CRN0 in dB Hertz. The de degradation was around uh, 3 to 4 dB Hertz for a Bluetooth device. Here I'd like to highlight that I have not explored the channel uh, option in Bluetooth device. So based on these uh, experiments, uh, following are the conclusions. So a study has shown that Wi-Fi routers and uh, mobile hotspot are causing the out of band interference to Navic S-band signal. Degradation in Navic S-band uh, received CRN0 increases as the Wi-Fi channel configuration changes from 1 to 13. Bluetooth device also causes 3 to 4 dB degradation in received CRN0 of Navic S-band signal. Uh, this uh, ITU need to look into the mitigation uh, technology to support the navigation services in S-band. And the last is mitigation methods to be employed to limit the power at the receiver antenna considering only Navic Manlo signal. Thanks for your uh, attention. Uh, with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah, this is Dennis. So I, I sent a question in the chat that uh, 
Wi-Fi interference on S Van seems to be quite serious. Looking at your interface data, when you brought the Wi-Fi router near to the S Van receiver, I think the CN0 drops more than 10 dB. I think yeah. that's very serious issue. So yeah. how this can be avoided? Because Wi-Fi and Bluetooth will be everywhere from now on. And if I walk on the street with my S band receiver, so that will definitely have uh, interference from uh, from the Wi-Fi signals. Yes, that's true. So any any uh, I mean the protection plan or any other things like uh, some special. Uh, I don't know how this can be done. Uh, like uh, some special filter in the receiver, is that possible? The, uh, what what uh, why, steps or plans of ISRO? Uh, that's why we have put two uh, bullets in conclusion. Mm -hmm. The first one was ITU needs to look into the methodology to mitigate the interference issue to support Navic service in S band. And the second was uh, a mitigation methods to be employed to limit the power at the receiver antenna considering only Navic uh, main low signal. So the second point uh, bullet uh, can be helpful. If we uh, employ a receiver with the uh, uh, receiver antenna uh, can limit the power to only Navic main low, the interference can be reduced significantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more thing about the Wi-Fi router you use, because sometimes uh, when you purchase a Wi-Fi router, so some routers maybe they actually follow the industry regulations like uh, transmit power and all. But some routers, they want to make a good business, so they just transmit the stronger power than permitted level. So are you sure that the router you used is, uh, uh, it, it transmits the power within the permitted level? And are, did you make sure that there are no other leakage signals coming uh, other than the antenna? We have used a, a D-Link router which emits one watt power. Oh, okay. One watt is too big, I think. That will definitely have an impact. Yeah. But is one watt allowed in India? Yeah, yes. Uh, okay. Region three. Um, uh, uh, in region three of ITU, the one watt power from Wi-Fi routers are allowed. Oh. Really, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Anyway, we'll check the IQ documents. Thank you very much. Thank you again thank for, you. for yeah. Thank you for for your presentation. Um, now we we will move to our next uh, presenter. It will be Mr. Dinesh Manander from the University of Tokyo. He will cover another aspects of Genesis accuracy errors as well as he will talk about software installation setup and check data. Dinesh, the floor is yours. Hello, Dinesh. Dinesh, you are muted. Sorry. OK, so is this OK? I suppose you yes. can hear now. Yeah, sorry for yes, that. Yes, we can see your slides. OK, so uh, my my talk now will involve various things. So basically, I'll give a very brief 
brief introduction about the accuracy errors and coordinate systems. So, but you already you already listened about the errors or accuracy from Galileo and also Navic in very detail. Uh, and my presentation is not a technical things, but I just tell you some of the keywords that we will be using tomorrow during the exercise. So my my objective of this presentation is to let you know some of the keywords that we will be using in terms of the file format, in terms of the accuracy errors and the coordinate systems. But we are not going to discuss in detail uh, what is the, uh, uh, this uh, datum and all geodesy and all. I'm not expert on that. So we need uh, maybe one or two hours lecture from the expert in that field. But I'm just going to give you some keywords that we need tomorrow and day after tomorrow to, to do the exercise because we'll be using those words to set up the parameters in the software in RTKE. So this is first part. And the second part today, I will tell you which software you have to install, download and install. I send you the link today, this early morning from Japan time. I hope you have read those emails and some of you already installed and downloaded the data and please download the data and make sure that it works so that we can work tomorrow for the exercise. Okay. So two, two things. So let me go through some of my slides. Uh, I, I know that this uh, session, the participants, there are experts here, so many experts and also some are beginners and other people, they already know what is GNSS, they have been working. But nevertheless, so there may be some people who are just the beginning or basics. So today we use the word called GNSS and that means GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, Beidou, BDS or Compass, QGSS, Navic, and in the past we used to call IRNSS. So these are all the systems. So when we say GNSS, so we'll be uh, collect collectively saying all these uh, systems. Okay, so sometimes when we need to like log the data only for GPS, then in the software we select only GPS or GLONASS or Galileo, and also in the data format you will see so like uh, sometimes G GPS, GLONASS. Sometimes you will see GNSS. Uh, the first two keywords like a GN, GP, GL or GA. BD and there are different naming conventions if you look at different types of software so we can see those tomorrow but today I'm just telling you that so we have this type of naming conventions and for example in the Japanese system QJ so sometimes you see in the software the capital letter J for Japan sometimes some makers they write a QJ and it's different from different uh, in a different software and different systems and so on. And also we have SBUS, uh, the augmentation system. So these are the, again, the satellite, but they provide some uh, correction data for your GPS for integrity. We call the integrity to make sure that the satellite signals you are receiving are in a good health and they can be used for your uh, services, critical services like ICAO for aviation. Okay. So these are some uh, special signals that are broadcasted, not from the GPS satellites, but some, some other satellites like the uh, communication satellites. Okay. And these services are provided from different countries like uh, WAS in USA or MSAS. Now MSAS in future will be Mars to QGSS the system. And we have EGNOS from Europe, Gagan from India, STCM from Russia, and the new service providers are coming for us. For example, Nigeria, and also Korea, they are coming up with including the navigation system in future and also Australia and New Zealand. And this, uh, you know, so I just have one slide to tell you that how it works. So probably there may be some participants who are a bit new to this. So the in the GPS or GNSS, what it does is it just transmits a signal from the satellite and that comes to your receiver. So the receiver is always looking at this signal and and the uh, uh, counting the time to travel from the satellite to the receiver and there is a way to do count this uh, time or the time taken to travel from the satellite to the receiver. So this whole process we call the signal acquisition or signal tracking. So there are different steps of doing all these things. 
So by, by taking the time from the satellite to the receiver, so we can compute the distance. And if we have uh, this distance from four satellites, we can compute the position data. So this is a very, very basic logic of how it works. Okay? So for example, we have a four satellites, and if you know the distance from all the four satellites, you can compute the position of this receiver. Okay? So this is the very basic principle. And now, you know, to do that, you have to know the, the uh, satellite position data. But in the GPS, we don't know the satellite position data directly, but what we know is uh, orbit data. So the orbit of the satellites, how they are moving. And also we know the time when these signals are transmitted. So by knowing the transmitted time in the signal and also the orbit of these satellites, we can compute the distance from here. Uh, I sorry, we can compute the position of these satellites by knowing the orbit data. And this orbit data in the signal processing tomorrow, we call the ephemeris data. So when we say ephemeris data, so please remember that this is related with the satellite orbit data. Okay. So these are some terminologies. So ephemeris data, and also you will sometimes hear almanac data. So it's again the orbit data, but with the lower resolution of the accuracy. Okay. So almanac data, ephemeris data, they all refer to the satellite orbit data. And we also need the satellite uh, transmit time. And here we call the GPS time or TOW. So we'll see these things coming up tomorrow. Okay. And I will skip this. So please refer this uh, web, uh, handout later. So some signal details. So we have so many signals now, and this is just an example for GPS. We have L1, L2, L5, three frequencies. So when we say band, L1 band, L2 band, or L5 band, for Galileo, they say E1, E2, E5, uh, E1, E5, and E6. It doesn't have E2. And for Beidou, B1, B2, B3, and IRN NSS has only L5 and uh, S band. And QGSS is a very crowded one, it has all L1, L2, L5, and L6. Okay. So they are referring to the frequency actually. This band means the frequency. So in terms of the these values, so L1 is this one, L2 is this value, and so on. And within this L1, each frequency, we have many different types of signals. The civilian signal called CA, and some new signals called C and some uh, military or restricted signals called PY, which we cannot use. Also, some other signals like uh, GLONASS, they have this type of signal. Okay. So this is all the, the summary of the GNSS signal, the frequencies in L1 and L5 and L2 and L6. So Galileo has uh, this uh, one here, E6. B3 is near to E6, and also QZ has L6. So this Galileo and QZ, the, this is a similar frequency here to provide the PPP or high accuracy services, Madoka Silas in terms of QGSS and HAS for Galileo. And here we have so many L5 signals, okay? And the L1 is too crowded here. And this is how it looks like, like uh, we have uh, in my uh, earlier presentation, I mentioned that we have a course station in different countries from our university collaboration. So we have uh, the university in Jakarta, University of Indonesia, Chulalongkorn University in Thailand, Bangkok, and the University of Philippines in Manila. And uh, this is in uh, Kuala Lumpur and Vietnam, and of course, Tokyo. And also we have some other, but I didn't put all. So this is how the satellite looks like. So if you look at this sky plot, so you see 50, around 50 satellites. So it's too crowded. So the thing is that how we can use, how we can uh, exploit these freely available signal for your applications. So these signals are free. You don't have to pay to receive these uh, satellite signals. You just need a receiver. So if you have a receiver, you can receive all these signals and then it's up to you how you want to use it. And in Galileo, you saw hundreds of these applications listed there. So you can use it for your transportation. You can use for marine in the, like in India, they have all these uh, 
tracking for the marine services, fishing uh, uh, services, and so on. So it's there are enormous applications, and it's up to you how you want to use it. Okay. But you need a receiver, and then you need to develop a system on on top of that. And this is also a brief slide how it looks like in the different uh, countries. So in uh, Tokyo, when we log the data for 24 hours and plot this type of uh, the satellite visibility tracks, and you see uh, in the northern hemisphere, we don't see the satellites over here. But if you go near to the equator like uh, Jakarta, so plus 10 minus 10, so you see uh, you don't see much little bit of this and here, OK? So it's uh, more like this in Jakarta. And if you go to Maputo in the Mozambique, so it's uh, like this. Okay, you don't see here then because this is in the southern hemisphere. The country is in southern hemisphere. So this is how the GPS satellites looks like in the different uh, regions of the world. So now I would like to tell you a little bit about the data formats because uh, tomorrow I already provided you the sample data to download and if some of you have already downloaded so you will see I think you have an NMA. I don't think you have NMA data. You have UVX file. You have a uh, probably Trimble uh, file and also Rhinex file I think or one example is with also Binex. So we provide you different types of uh, data formats so that you can see how it looks like or you can learn how to process those data or you need to learn how to convert from one format to another format. Okay. So that's the reason we provide different types of data format and I think all of you don't have access to the GPS receiver but still you want to learn so you need uh, some sample data and these sample data are quite good sample data and we prepare this type of sample data for training uh, and we spend a lot of time to prepare the sample data. So we have 24 hours uh, observation data. We have one hour observation data. We log the data in a static mode, dynamic mode, and so on. With the high-end receiver like a Trimble, very expensive receivers like a Trimble, and also we have Septentrio. Also we have uh, some uh, Jabba uh, receivers. And also we use uh, very low cost receivers like a uh, U-Blocks where it costs just $100 and still you can do the RTK. So that's the purpose to teach you how we can do this high accuracy processing using the low cost receiver system. But we need to know the data formats. So basically there are these some of these, uh, there are few formats. One of them is a very common is NMA format. So any GPS receiver and basically they output the latitude longitude data in the NMA format. So this is an industry standard. So defined by the National Marine Electronics Association. Uh, so the, if you look at NMA format, you will always see a header like this, a dollar. It always starts with a sign called sign dollar. And then it will be a five character like this, GP, GZA. And then you have other things. So this is the sort of a header. This is telling you what this sentence contents. contents. Okay. So dollar GP, we call a talker ID, means this data is related with the GPS. Okay. GP means GPS, and GGA means the this uh, position data. Okay. So you can check the NMA sentence in the website. There are lots of material on this. So the format is something like this. This is one example for GPGZA. So the way you have to read is dollar GP. So this means, OK, this is for GPS. GZA is uh, related with the uh, position fixed data, three location and accuracy. And the way you have to read is, so this is comma separated variable. OK, so dollar GP, then you know this is for GPS, GZA. And then you have this one is a time in UTC. OK, one, two, three, five, one, nine means 12 hours, 35 minutes and 19 seconds. So this is in UTC and this is the latitude. So this latitude, the way you have to read is not not the 4800. This is a 48 degree and 07.038 minutes. OK, so please remember this uh, 48. Min degree and 07 minutes. Okay, you have to separate when you read it. 
So the way it is output is like this, but when you read, you have to read the two two digits and then the remaining is the minutes. And in the case of uh, longitude, so this is a uh, three digits. So you please read three digits as a degree. So 011 degree and 31.000 minutes. Okay, this is how you need to read. And this is telling you north or east, okay, north south or east west. And then also the the status here it will tell you what type of uh, this status is this. So or like whether this is a standard positioning service, whether it is a DGPS, whether it is a PPS, RTK or float RTK and all. Okay. So please, uh, I think this NMA format is a uh, little bit older version and some software like in uh, RTK leave. So this one is a uh, uh, RTK fix and two is a uh, RTK float solution. So please see the user manual as well to understand what does this mean. So don't get confused with the NMA this fix, uh, quality indicator and the other this uh, indicator from other software. So please refer the documents. Uh, you have to refer always the user manual. Okay. And the next one is telling you so how many satellites were visible and all the uh, and the DOP dilution of poison. So this is always telling you so how good is your data? So what is the expected accuracy or the error in your position computation of uh, these values? So that if your DOP is uh, large, you have a large error. So it's smaller is better. This is the guideline. Like uh, if your DOP is more than 2.5 or more than 3, so that means you have large error. Okay. So this will tell you a sort of a guideline of about the error or the accuracy of your data when it is output like this latitude longitude. And this is the uh, height, the uh, geoid height. So later I have a slide to tell you about the ellipsoidal height and the geoid height. So many people make a mistake here. They mistakenly take on the ellipsoidal height as a uh, geoid height. Okay? So don't don't get confused this either. And uh, the and when you have this ellipsoidal height uh, displayed, so also it will tell you, so this is a 545 meter, this is the mean sea level, okay? The, in the NMA, so mean sea level, but the receiver actually don't know the mean sea level. It only knows this uh, uh, elliptical, ellipsoidal height, okay? But this ellipsoidal height is not given in the, this sentence. So from the ellipsoidal height, it computed the mean sea level because we are used to it, the mean sea level. We understand the mean sea level height. That's the reason in GPS, in the NMA sentence, so it outputs the mean sea level by uh, by using the the difference between the geoid height and the ellipsoidal height. And that separation is 46.9 uh, meters in this case. So this may be you are a little bit confused. So I have another slide later, so then you will be clear about this. Okay. And the, at the end, so you have a CRC check for this whole sentence to make sure that the data which is coming out from the receiver is correct. So many receivers, uh, almost all the GPS receiver, they can output NMA data. And this Rhinox data is a uh, it's a receiver independent exchange format. Okay. And this format is necessary because uh, you may be using their data coming from a Trimble, from a Jabat, from a Septentrio, from Ublux, and so many other different types of receiver available in the market. So, but they normally have their own proprietary, their own format to output the data because it takes more uh, less memory in a binary format, compact format, and also it takes more uh, more less data to, to transmit uh, that uh, binary compact format. But you cannot use the binary data as it is because uh, you will be getting the correction data from another receiver. If you have your own receiver sets, like you have your own receiver sets wherever you go, then it's okay to use your own format. But if you want to get the correction data from somewhere else, and and if you are only using your rover or your field unit, then probably you need to get the correction data from someone else or some other receiver. Then 
when you request for the correction data or the basis system data, that may be from the Trimble, that may be from uh, Novatel, that may be from any type of receiver. So they may have a different format, so it doesn't help you. So that's the reason that whenever we exchange the data, we use the independent data format. So that's the reason they have developed the Rhinox format, and this is a very well documented or uh, the standard formats there. And but uh, what it contains is uh, it it doesn't contain the output version data. It contains the raw data, raw observation data. Okay, that means the pseudo range, carrier phase, and in some cases Doppler and SNR and so on. So at least we need the uh, two parameters, pseudo range and carrier phase, to do our post processing with the code phase or carrier phase. Okay, and when you look at the Rhinox file, so depending upon the version, again Rhinox has evolved a lot from the beginning when there were only GPS and GLONASS. Now we have so many satellites and so many new signals, so uh, we have uh, many different types of uh, data. So basically, so you will see the navigation data file and observation data file, two files, okay? So I, I call the N file and O file. N file is for navigation data, O file for observation data. And this navigation file has ephemeris related data, satellite orbit related data, time related data, because uh, I told you that uh, in the beginning, uh, to calculate the distance from the receiver to the satellite, you need the satellite orbit data. And this orbit data is provided in the end file. So you always need the end file. And to compute your position data, you have to find out the pseudo range related uh, uh, the observation actually. So uh, how many the cycles or how many code ranges, so code phases have been observed. So we call the pseudo range and carrier phase data. So they are given in the O file. So this is called the observation data that includes pseudo range, carrier phase, and in some cases Doppler and SNR as well. Okay. So these things are available in N file and O file. So basically two formats. So we need this to do the post processing. And there are different versions of a Rhinox. So three now, I think the Rhinox is now 3.04 or something like that. So I need to check the latest one. And so, and also it depends on the software, whether that software is compatible with your latest uh, Rhinox format or whether your hardware is uh, compatible with the latest version. So you need to check your manual for software and hardware. But anyway, so you have to understand that the Rhinox file format is uh, used to exchange the data between the receivers so that uh, any type of receiver, they can work seamlessly. And so this is one example of a 2.11, very old version, okay? The navigation data for GPS, so how it looks like. Uh, here is some hydrospheric related data. So this is the navigation data. In the header, you will see something like this. And here you will see for every satellite, the, the orbit related data here in the Rhinox format. So you can see the Rhinox uh, documentation and, and then you can interpret so what this means. So actually this format is a very old, not I don't say old, but it's a, a standard Fortran, uh, this uh, Fortran format. So in the past, so Fortran was very popular for engineering. So it was written like this. So you see D02 is a, nowadays we use the E, okay, 10 raised to power two. So this type of format you will see. So, but you, you don't have to remember this. So you just need to know N5. The software will do everything for you. So you don't have to interpret all these uh, complex values. And for the O file, the observation data, so you see here, sometimes when you do this, so it will say, oh, the first, this uh, Rhinox version is incompatible. That means you have to see what uh, Rhinox version you are using. For example, you will be using the latest 3.04 and your software says, oh, I cannot read this file. Then you have to convert to the uh, previous version, the older version, maybe 3.02 or 3.0, something like that. And this is providing you the observation data for every satellite to your receiver. Yeah. Here, if you look at this, so carrier phase measurement, code phase and carrier phase data for every satellite, this is satellite number and uh, time and so on. Okay, how many satellites are visible. And for every satellite, you have a pseudo range, 
L1, L2, and the carrier phase for L1, L2, and so on. Okay. And here is a, it, this is telling you which, uh, what is the sequence of the, your data here. Okay, Z10, Z12, GPS10, GPS12. This R is for Russia, Galileo. Okay, S for SBAS. This is RTCM. So RTCM stands for Radio Technical Commission for Maritime Services. And again, this is for the real time broadcast. Okay. For post processing, we can use the Rhinex, but for real time, you have to send the correction data from base to the rover, like in the RTK. If you want to do the real time uh, kinematic processing, you have to send the data in the real time. So we can use the RTCM format for that. And this is also very well documented. And if your receiver is capable of doing uh, broadcasting this type of correction data in the uh, receiver setting, you will see what type of message you will be broadcasting. So we'll see some of those settings tomorrow. Uh, then uh, depending upon the correction data you want to transmit, so you have to set in the receiver. So this is another format for real time correction. Okay. Now I will go very brief to the coordinate system, but this is just uh, one or two slides in a very brief way. So we, this everybody knows the geodetic coordinate system. So this is related with the latitude, longitude and the height. Okay? So we have art like a sphere and the equator. So this, uh, I just put an uh, image here, but this is what we're talking about, the geodetic coordinate system, latitude, longitude, and height. But uh, when we define the, the lat, long, and height of this peak, we need to know the mathematical model of the art. So this we call the datum or the geoid and all. Okay? So in GPS uses the WGS84. Okay, so the WGS84 defines the odds, these uh, parameters of the radius and the flatness, okay, the, the ellipse. Uh, so this uh, radius and the flatness define the shape of the art, and using that WGS84, the coordinates are computed. Okay? So we please remember that every GPS receiver uh, by default if you don't change the data, so it will be WGS84 by default. Okay? And then we have another coordinate system, which is called the art center art fix. Okay? So this is uh, the easiest way is that just to remember that. So you define the center of the art as uh, your origin. And from here, you compute uh, your coordinate in the XYZ direction. Okay? It's a sort of a planner coordinate system. And then you can convert from a uh, geodetic to ECF by using uh, these uh, mathematicals. So from uh, geodetic to ECF or ECF to geodetic. So in this training, we don't do all these type of uh, mathematical computations like uh, how to calculate the poison data from the pseudo range that we don't do in this uh, our ICG generated training. But in the summer school in Japan, which is organized by Tokyo University of Marine Science, we do this type of uh, uh, training exercise. So we provide the pseudo range and from the pseudo range, we compute the poison data. In that, when we do that, those type of exercises, then we don't use the, we, we use the ECF coordinate, okay? That's much easier to work with the ECF. So you will be working with the ECF and then once you get all the answers, then you convert from ECF to uh, WGS84 and output your lat long height data. So this is what I talk about the, the WGS84. So the parameters of WGS84 used by GPS is given here. So for Galileo, I think they have uh, this type of datum, which may be, uh, I think, I don't know whether this is same or little bit, I think this is a little bit different. For GLONASS, they have their own parameter. For NAVIC, I think they have their own parameter of this. So this, we, I, I don't know about all the systems, so I know about the WGS84. Okay. So these are the parameters that we use to convert or do the calculations uh, in the, all these uh, mathematical computations.
Okay, and uh, this uh, little bit about ellipsoid, geoid, and the mean sea level height. So this is uh, very confusing. Uh, so first, the ellipsoidal surface, we define the surface of the earth as a mathematical surface, and that's defined by the ellipsoid. And that ellipsoid in the case of a GPS is a WGS84. So we have an ellipsoidal surface, and then we have the geoid surface, which is the like uh, this uh, surface, which is near to our uh, uh, gravity. So you can, so this red line means they have the same gravity, okay? Wherever this is uh, up and down, so this is uh, the gravity is the same. And so this means if there's a C, so your C level will be here. But some places there's no sea, okay? like uh, some mountain areas, there's no sea. But you imagine if there's a sea, so you will have a water up to here. Okay? This is how we uh, define this geoid surface. So ellipsoidal surface, geoid surface, and then you have the actual topography or the mountains and valleys and like your roads going up and down. So this is your actual topograph uh, topography, okay? the actual your how to say the art surface uh, for example you have this uh, like a mountain here okay but if there's a sea where will be the geoid surface or this this we can uh, match, uh, compute by doing the gravity survey and all so this is a bit difficult but we can more or less estimate this and the there is a global estimation of this geoid for the whole whole art and using this value, so the GPS receiver by default can convert from the GUI to the from ellipsoidal to the joint. And that's why we can compute the mean sea level from the GPS. But that will be uh, uh, very much approximated. So if you need to know the very true, uh, true means very correct within the centimeter level, then you need a very detailed uh, gravity survey to define this type of a GUI survey. And also you need to define this uh, vertical uh, uh, mean sea level, the vertical your control point. Okay? So you need to do the sea level survey, you need to do the gravity survey to define this one. And once you know, like if you want to find out the, the height of this mountain peak here, so what is the mean sea level, then the process will be like, if you put the GPS receiver here, you get the ellipsoidal height. Okay? You don't get the mean sea level because the GPS only knows the ellipsoidal height because it uses the, uh, uh, the, the mathematical model of the Earth to give you the coordinate data, latitude, longitude, and height. So it, it's the ellipsoidal height you get. But what we need is not the ellipsoidal height, we need the, uh, the mean sea level height from here to here. Okay? So this is what we need. But GPS will give you only this. So how to get this and then how to calculate this is our problem to get the mean sea level. So in order to do this, so you have to know this value. So this value will be provided by the survey department of your country, or there may be some other sources to resources or uh, some uh, other information uh, source in your country to know this value, depending upon your location data or you if you approximate value is okay, then you just use the global geoid, uh, we call the geoid height, the separation between the ellipsoidal and the geoidal geoid surface. So this value is globally available. So you can just use that n value. And then you uh, use this n and h to calculate the h value. Okay. So if this is below the this ellipsoidal, so you subtract. If this is above, you add. Okay. So this is how we calculate the mean, mean sea level. Okay. So please check this slide. So this is uh, quite nicely illustrated because many people get confused. So I made this a little bit uh, more clear to understand. And uh, if you look at the NMA sentence, so I gave you the example before, and this is a very new NMA data format. Here you see we don't have a GPGGA here. Now we have a ZN. Now, in my first slide, I tell, told you that uh, now we call the ZNSS rather than GPS GLONASS and all. So when I when we see ZN means this position data 
is computed by using more than one system. It's not only the GPS computed position data, it's uh, maybe GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and multiple satellite systems. So that's the reason we see ZN, okay? And G GZA is the position data, related with the position data. And here is telling you, now this is my altitude MSL, is a 54.4 meters here. And then we have this geoid separation or geoid height is 39.6 meters. So this geoid separation is uh, this, uh, this value, N value. Okay? So using these two, using the, this one and this one, so the receiver gave you this MSL, means sea level height, that is 54.4. Okay? So this is what you are getting here in the NMS sentence. So this output is from U blocks, but also other receivers, they output exactly in the same format. So it doesn't matter whether you use a receiver type A or B, you get, it should be in this format. This is a standard. And if you look at this uh, NMS sentence, you see dollar GN and then GSA, okay, GSV, the satellite. So GSV is related with the satellite vehicle. Okay. So all the visible satellites, so these are one set, GSV 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay? So the way you read GGA and the way you read GSV are different. This is related with the visible satellite and there are more than like a 50 or 60 satellites. So in one sentence, we can't write all the information of the satellite. And this five is telling you that you have to read five sentences. And this is the first sentence you see, total is five, and this is the first one. This is total is five of this, and this is the second one. One, two, three, four, five, okay? And I think one sentence has a six, or we can see the, uh, the uh, I don't know how many, I think this is a six, I think. Okay, so, and this means, so how many channel the receiver can output you know, uh, in uh, your, your capacity of the receiver, because although there are 60 satellites visible, so it may not be outputting everything, or the channel may be limiting the all the visible satellites. Okay? So it depends on the your satellite, uh, your receiver channel capacity, how many satellite signal it can receive, and how it can use the position data, and also you have some control on that depending on the receiver, you can specify, I want to use only GPS and the GLONASS, or you can say, I want I want to use only GPS and Galileo. Okay. So these type of things uh, is possible. So please look at these type of uh, details later, or the sample data we provided. And uh, here is a dollar GB, this is for uh, Beidou. Okay, so some points we have to be careful when you do the survey, like a datum. So please make sure which datum you are using. Uh, already somebody asked, some people asked in the previous presentation, so what is the datum or the geoid and so on. So make sure that which one you are using in your receiver. By default, GPS uses WGS84, or you can change it in your receiver. So some receivers, they allow to change the, this datum from WGS84 to the datum you use in uh, your country. Some maybe, I don't know, in the US they have a different one, Europe they have different one in Asia. So Everest datum is quite uh, widely used in many countries. Uh, and also then you have to use, uh, you have to know what what is the datum used in your map. Like you have a map coming from the topography. So you have to know what there's, also you will see the exact latitude and longitude but the lat long in your map and the lat long in your GPS data, they may be coming up from the different datums. And when you try to overlay your GPS measured data over the map, it will not match. You will always have an error. And sometimes that error may be as big as a kilometer or maybe a few hundred meters. And then you will say, oh, this GPS is not working well. And that's not the GPS uh, problem, but it's the, the, the coordinate system you are trying to overlay two different, uh, same coordinate lat long, but using the two different types of datums. So it doesn't match. So 
you have to convert from WGS84 to your local datum or your local uh, coordinate system. Okay, so please make sure that which one you are using if you need to overlay all these things. And also height. So when you, so this is more related with the horizontal things uh, you overlay and in the vertical. So height again, if you are going to compare your GPS height or the ellipsoidal height with the mean sea level, there will be a difference of at least 20 to 40 meters. OK, so please make sure that which height you are looking at in your reference uh, data, whether that's uh, normally we we have a mean sea level height because with the mean sea level we know we, we, we can feel that, OK, um, maybe 100 meters above the sea or 500 meters above the sea or 10 meters below the sea that we can imagine. But if I say ellipsoidal height, so you are 100 meters of ellipsoidal height, I really don't know where am I. Okay? So we use the mean sea level for our daily this thing. Uh, all our uh, in the maps and all. So you have to convert from ellipsoidal to mean sea level. And this is not always easy if you need a very high accuracy. So this is the uh, one uh, issue when the, uh, Mount Everest was a measure two years back, and they recently published a new height. And okay, so they put uh, on the top of this is a base station, but they put that uh, they measure on the top of the Everest, and they can get the ellipsoidal height easily. But to convert from ellipsoidal to the mean sea level was quite quite uh, difficult, and it takes a lot of time. To compute this. OK, and we go to the errors. Uh, it's a very quick uh, uh, again the, the outline of the errors. So let's remember that when we talk about the uh, errors, so we use the accuracy and precision. So sometimes we use a uh, very interchangeably accuracy and precision. We mix up. So what is accuracy and what is precision? So when I say accuracy means this is with respect to a true value. We know the true value and with respect to that true value. So how much error I have? So if I know that with respect to true value, then that's my accuracy. And precision means. I don't know the true value, but I'm measuring the same point 100 times and then I take my mean standard deviations. So that's a relative uh, measurement, okay? relative accuracy or then that, that I call the precision. For example, now you put the GPS antenna at the same point and you take the observation every day for one week and you take the uh, you take the mean. Then you say, OK, my precision is uh, one centimeter, but that's the precision. But what's about accuracy? So how good that po measurement point from the actual true value? How much is the offset or the other errors there? Okay, So that we need to know. So we need probably both accuracy and precision. Okay. So this is what we I'm saying in a, like a graphics accuracy. So this is my true value. So if your measurements are like this, so you are neither precise nor accurate. So if you take a standard deviation, you have a large standard deviation and also you are far away from the this uh, true value. Okay. But sometimes so in the GPS, probably when we do RTK, so we are something like this. We are precise, but we are not accurate. Okay, You may be off by your true point, maybe by half a meter, but your standard deviation or the mean value may be one centimeter or two centimeter. Even if your mean is two centimeter error, one centimeter error, you are still far away from your true value. Okay, So this is an offset, but this is not a big problem. Once you know this offset, you can bring the whole points here. Okay, so. The, then the next problem is so how to know my offset between this uh, true point and my measure value. So uh, this is accurate but not precise. So I don't know whether this case is possible or not. So you are measuring, so you get a very accurate value, but still your standard deviation is a little bit higher. And this is what we want precise and accurate. So maybe PPP is like this, RTK is something like this. For me, so PPP is uh, so tomorrow maybe some, some of you will ask. So what's the benefit of PPP compared to RTK? So in RTK we compute the uh, rover position data with respect to the base distance coordinate. But what will happen if the base distance coordinate itself is offset by half a meter? 
then all these will be offset by half a meter. Okay? Then you will have uh, some bias here. So that's the systematic error you have here. And in this case, so the when we do the PPP, so it uses so many parameters and we don't have a base station there. So we expect this type of uh, uh, precise, uh, precise and accurate uh, position data. Okay. And when we are now we are doing uh, this type of uh, PPP and RTK comparison and we find uh, something like this with the PPP. So uh, you will see this uh, when we do some exercise. And some of these uh, parameters that is used in the GPS, so RMS, 2D RMS, CP, all these ones, so different manufacturers use different types of these definitions to show their figures. So some uh, clever manufacturers, they just use the CP because, uh, and many people don't know what is CP. So this means like in the Navic presentation, you saw you draw a circle and if that circle is a, uh, say one meter, that means 50, only 50% 50 of the observations will lie within that one meter radius circle. Okay? And the rest of the 50% may be anywhere. So this is uh, maybe the, the safest <laughs> accuracy <laughs> definition for the makers. But if you really want, if you really were serious to, uh, about the accuracy, so please ask 95% or one sigma or two sigma, like that type of accuracy level. Okay? And always the the height accuracy is uh, at I think about 1.2 times worse than the horizontal accuracy. Okay. And there are some other performance measurements in the GNSS like a TTFF through time to first fix. So I uh, the standard accuracy, DGPS accuracy, and RTK accuracy. And so I will not go to these things. So TTFF is uh, the time to like when you put the receiver on for the first time, we call the quality start. Okay. Sometimes while you are observing, so temporarily it goes off, and then I mean some sometimes you, you don't uh, see the uh, satellites, and uh, you you put the receiver to like off, but still your ephemeris data is still available. That we call the warm and hot is means that it's just a temporary uh outage of the some visible satellites so this will be very fast maybe a few seconds uh maybe one two seconds this may be about uh, six seconds like that but this will be for any receiver this quality start will be 30 seconds or more okay it is not possible that the quality start will have less than 30 seconds of uh, ttff time if somebody says some manufacturers say it's less than 30 seconds that's not true it's impossible OK, so this is what I'm saying. I will skip this one. And for RTK, so if you buy or if you look at the receiver specification of the RTK receiver, like a very high end Trimble or Novatel or Jabat, you will see in their doc, in their uh, specifications, uh, specification something like two centimeter plus one PPM. Uh, it may be two centimeter or one centimeter or five centimeter. I don't know. It may be one or two ppm or like that. But anyway, you will see something like this x centimeter plus y ppm. So what does this mean? So how to read this value is that, for example, if it is two centimeter plus one ppm, it means you will have an error of two centimeter. Like when you have an RTK fix, you will have an error of two centimeter always. And this error, we don't know whether this is CP or 2D RMS or RMS. Anyway, you will have a two centimeter error. Plus one PPM means one parts per million of error due to the base length. That means the distance between your base station and the rover. Okay? So if we convert this one PPM, for example, this converts to one centimeter of error for every 10 kilometer of distance between the base and the rover. Okay. So if your base and rover is 10 kilometer far away, then with this specification, you will have at least three centimeter of error. Okay. So this is how we can interpret. So if your base is a 40 kilometer away, you will have a four centimeter due to the base length alone and then two centimeters. So that means you will have at least six centimeters of error. Okay, 
So don't just look at this figure. This is very important. And when your base increases by 40 kilometer from 10 to 40, so linearly, we can think this will be four centimeter, but in practice, this may be more because the atmospheric condition at the base and the rover, atmospheric and tropospheric will be more different than uh, when the base length is smaller. So this error will actually increase more. Okay? So please be careful what it is saying and how you understand these values. Okay? This is just a guideline to interpret the, the meaning of these uh, uh, values provided by the manufacturer. Okay. So the longer the baseline, the larger the error. So for a good RTK, RTK, so for high end receiver, more than 40 kilometers is not recommended. So you don't get this uh, like a few centimeter of accuracy, it's not possible. You really need a very high figure here and that will go up the cost. Okay, so that's all. I will not go through this because you saw so many things. Uh, you please check the slides. So I just have uh, some uh, keywords here. Okay. So that's all for this part. And after this, I will tell you how to install the software and how to check the data. And I want to make sure that you could uh, download the software and data for tomorrow. So I can take a few questions here and then yeah, Dinesh, we'll do, um, yes. do you do you want to look at the chat or I will just read you the, the few questions. Some of them I saw already have been answered. Yeah. So let me start from the from the beginning when you started your presentation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is the question I think related to your first slides. Why a peak um, is to represent the signal sent by different satellite constellations? Sorry. Why a peak to represent the signals sent by different satellite constellations? Why a peak? Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I could not understand. Which one? Um, Why a peak? Peak. What, what is peak? I believe I believe there were the graphs. And there were some peaks from the in the signal ah, which this are one? received from different satellites constellations. Ah, uh, oh, sorry, this one? No, I don't think it's uh, this, this slide. One. Is it this uh, slide? This? Uh, can you see my slide? So, is the question related with this? No, I'm just making this type of uh, pulses, but the signal is not like this. Yeah. It's okay. uh, it's a like code and carrier, the signal is like this, okay? Okay. So this I want, I made it this because uh, I'm now referring to this uh, PI codes, the things, but actually the signal is not like this. So this is all this code, carrier, all combined. And when it comes out from the antenna, it looks like this and that's like a noise, okay? So it's not, not uh, like that type of a peaks, I mean the pulses. So it's uh, something like a noisy signal. So it's like this. So maybe yeah. that, that was the question, yeah. Okay, so well, the slides will be, as I said, available on the website later today and we inform you, please study them. And if you still have some questions, send it to us and we refer you to the to the, our speakers. The following question is just, give away it. Is it a EDM 200, 2008 model? Uh, no, for GPS, this is WGS-84. Okay. So I, I have no idea about EGM 2008. Okay. Because now you see we have a participation from around the globe. So yeah. there are so many datums and G, I mean the GIs used around the world. So many different things coming up. So sorry, I have no idea about EGM 2008. Yeah, so I another question. Yeah. Yes, I understand. Another question is again related to Rhinox. Rhinox yeah. is a type of correction file? No, no. It's not a correction file, it's just the observation data. 
So it, Rhinex has a two file formats. One is the satellite orbit data, the navigation data. Okay, so this is the satellite ephemeris related data. You see the slide here I mark. And another is the observation data. So observation data is a pseudolite and carrier phase basically. So this is the, the distance from the satellite to the receiver for every visible satellite, not the correction data. Okay. Yeah. Um, then another question is, how does the SNR from RINEX file differ from C2N data from the receiver? Uh, no, I think this is the CN0, not uh, because I, I mentioned earlier that uh, sometimes we use a very interchangeably SNR and CN0. This is a CN0 here, not mm -hmm. the SNR. Sorry for that. Okay. Again, related to Rhinex, can a Rhinex file to be trimmed into hourly file data? Yeah, yeah, that that's possible. Yeah. Is there any tool for Rhinex 3.05 analysis? I think so, yes. Uh, let me see. It. Uh, RTK leave 3.04 is okay. 3.05, so I will... I, I need to check whether it is now compatible with 3.05. 3.04 is okay for RTK leave, mm -hmm. but there may be some other software from the manufacturers who are out. If some receiver, they output 3.05, they should have a tool to read that, use that 3.05 as well. So the person who is asking this question, so if he has a receiver that output 3.05, so his receiver should be able to process other uh, Rhinex file in the 3.05 as well, because his receiver okay. can output 3.05, yeah. But articulately, we'll see tomorrow whether it has already 3.05 compatibility. Yep. All right. Yeah, so another question. Uh, so PPP is generally better than RTK? Uh, that's what my feeling. OK, <laughs> so I need to we need to discuss tomorrow with uh, other experts from uh, Tokyo University of Marine Science, Professor Kubo. So, so far for me, PPP is better because in terms of the, not in terms of the accuracy, but in terms of this uh, absolute coordinate system. Okay. So like uh, RTK, when you compute the coordinate, uh, your position data, so that is based on the, your base station. So if be your base station it has uh, some error, you will also have error. Okay. But uh, PPP is uh, not based on just one base station. Okay. They use a uh, lots of other background uh, sources of data. So in that sense, for to get the absolute coordinate, PPP is better. Mm -hmm. uh, another just two, two, three question. Um, are the, there tools that convert different file formats and calculate positioning data and errors nicely? Uh, their tool that going to yeah that that's what we are going to do tomorrow. So okay. I don't know what does it mean by nicely. So <laughs> so you will see yourself tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it it does. Yes, that's what we are going to do. Okay. So then there are a few questions I think related to the software. So mm -hmm. I let you now talk about the software installation, and then we. We we'll look at some more questions, but that's mm. basically it at this moment. Mm. Okay, okay. So somebody asks for a PPP versus PPK. So I'm using the word PPK for post-processing kinematic. That's actually the RTK, but RTK we for the normally we use for real-time kinematic. And if you use the post-processing kinematic. So I would like to say PPK. Okay, so RTK or PPK is the same, whether you do the real time or post process. But PPP is a different. Okay. In the uh, okay, let 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 me show this slide. So this is very important. The PPP and RTK. Actually, you saw the slide in the uh, Galileo presentation as well. Okay. 
So RTK and PPP. Uh, where is this? Okay, I don't have here. Uh, maybe this one. Okay, here. Uh, oh, I need to share another file. Wait. Maybe I just share the whole screen. Desktop. So, can you see my screen now? Yeah. So, okay. So, yes. tomorrow we are going to do this. Okay. So, I have provided you this data, this ready scatter. So, we don't, we have not done any error correction. Now, with this data, you see there is a plus minus three meters of error here, plus minus five meters. This is a standard uh, point poisoning. Okay. Oh, sorry. This is written single point. It's the SPS, standard point poisoning. And you do the DGPS, you will get this type of accuracy. And you do RTK, you get this type of accuracy. RTK or PPP, okay, you get this one with the same data. Okay. So this you will see tomorrow. And uh, now also in the Galileo presentation, you saw this uh, differential correction. This is the RTK or PPK, real time or post processing kinematic. Okay. You put, you need a base station at a non point, and then you send the correction data, or you send the observation data, all the some uh, observation or correction data from base to the rover. Because you put a station at a non point, so you know the error here. So this information is sent to the rover or the receiver in the field. And then you will also use the same error, uh, same satellites which are visible at the base to do the RTK. So this one, when you do the RTK here, they will select the same common satellites. For example, if this is 5, 22, 30, 10, and 15, this will also choose the same satellite. You, this one now seeing 28, but this will not use 28 because the base doesn't see 28. Okay? So you need the common satellites here and here. So that's the reason this base length cannot be very, very long. If it's long, so you may not have a similar satellite. And another reason is the tropospheric or ionospheric uh, condition here and here will be different. Okay? So the correction parameters applied here will not be valid for this one. That's the reason you can't go very far. So if you want to cover the whole country, then you have to put many, many base stations around your, in the country to cover the, your whole country for RTK. So in Japan, there are 1,300 stations. So in average, it's about 20 to 30 kilometer one station in Japan. So if you want to do this in Indonesia, it's a huge country. It's extremely difficult. It's too costly to maintain this. So you can just put maybe a few tens of these and then probably you can do PPP. Now in the case of PPP, so the difference is you don't need a best station. Okay? You don't have best station here. Okay? All the correction data that is necessary to remove the error, basically the satellite orbit and the clock error is coming from the satellite. This may be QGSS. So now Galileo they are providing, so you can also receive this type of correction data from the Galileo in, a, in their own format. So you will have basically orbit correction error, clock correction error, and maybe some other information is coming from the satellite. So using that, you can do the PPP, and that gives you about 10 centimeter or few centimeters of error. Okay? So in Japan, we have CLAS. So you will see this in the, the QGS presentation from Mr. Kogre. So CLAS is a few centimeter accuracy, two to five centimeter or one to five centimeter. But Madoka is 10 to 20 centimeter. This is a little bit less correct, but this is globally available. This is available only in Japan. Yeah. So similarly for Galileo, they have a PPP, PPP AR, and they provide you a different level of accuracy and different uh, level of this observation time. So AR probably require, PPP AR require less observation time and so on. So this is the benefit or merit of the PPP system. You get a question data from the satellite itself. But the demerit or disadvantage is that you need a special receiver 
to receive this signal. Okay. So for Galileo, you need a special E6 receiver, and you need a HAS capable receiver, which at the moment probably not available in the market, or even if it is available, it may be a bit expensive. And this is the same for Madoka and Silas. The receivers is uh, not very widely available. And those which are receiver, they cost maybe $5,000 or $10,000. Okay, it's too expensive at the moment. But tomorrow, not the tomorrow, or day after, I'm going to introduce this Madoka receiver that's just a few hundred dollars. And we, some universities in Asia, now we have collaboration. So we provide a few units of those receiver to do the summer joint research. So it's just uh, maybe a few hundreds of uh, dollars for that. Okay, okay so please, uh, this will be doing to tomorrow and the after tomorrow. So please remember these two slides. Okay, RTK, you need a base and correction data. And today I send you this data, base decision data, and also this data. So when we say static, so in the folder you say static means the rover is not moving. This is always a fixed static. When we say static means this is fixed, not moving as well. And in the folder, we have a dynamic means this is moving in the car. Okay, so you have two sets of data. So now I'm going to the data type explaining. So static and dynamic data and base and the robot. Okay, you have now at least four sets of data that I send you. And uh, OK, so I stop here. And let me show you the data that you need to download. I'm just looking at this whole time because we have participants around the world. <laughs> so what time is it and so on. Um, let me go to. Oh no. So I send you the link, this link. So in the email, you will see this link. If not, you can now copy uh, here. And here you will see the, the list here. So you will see online GNSS training. So here you have a link. So RTK Drive, RTK Leave. So please download this software today and make sure that it runs in your computer. So you must download the RTK Leave software. And this also, I recommend this to check the UVX data. This is from uh, UBlocks. Okay. So in RTK Leave, if you click here, you go to this uh, GitHub page, this RTK Leave homepage, and then you see here. So please download this version, okay? 243B32. And here is the binary. Please download the binary. Don't download the source. You can, but it doesn't help you at the moment. So please download the binary AP for Windows from my GitHub here. If you click here, okay, and then you will get this space. Uh, okay, and then you press this one, download zip. Okay. So with this, you can download the uh, the article leave. So once you download, just unzip and you go to the bin folder, this BIN folder. Okay. And if you go to the bin folder, you will see RTK launch file. Uh, where is uh, RTK launch? Yeah, you see this RTK launch. Then you will use this file to launch all the functions of the RTK Leap. So we'll use this uh, program tomorrow for the whole day. Okay. So please install this software and make sure that this is working. So RTK launch, okay, you have to do this. And then this is one part. And the U center, this is uh, goes to U blocks. So here is the use center. So please download the, this one. Okay, this will be useful to look at the UBX data that I pro provided. So this is one software that we'll use to look at the data. And this RTK Droid is our our uh, 
software for using RTK in the Android. So you can download and to get the password, I would like to maintain who are using this for RTK Droid. And because we do these updates time to time and I need to keep a track for that to give you a service. And you need to register here. So I will get this and then I'll send you the password. Okay, please uh, help with this registration. Here you can download, but you need the password to unzip. And this is the RTK, and this is also based on RTK Lib, but we use uh, modified this for Android. So you can use your smartphone and the GPS receiver together to do the field survey. You don't need a computer then. And for Madoka PPP, we have uh, very recently developed the Madroid system. So again, for Madroid, but Madroid is a little bit now due to some restrictions, so we need to have uh, some sort of a collaboration for that. Uh, but if still you can send the uh, request if you want to use, but uh, we need to make an agreement that uh, we'll collaborate to do the, uh, some studies using the Madoka. Okay? And for some universities, we also provide the receiver uh to do some joint collaboration but uh, we don't have so many receivers so it depends whether you can get it or not okay. anyway if you are interested so please see the some notes here and send me the request and if it is approved we can do that okay this is uh, anybody can get it but this one is at the moment is a little bit uh, limited because we don't have so many receivers uh, and then we have the data set. So these are the data set. Tomorrow we'll be using it. Okay. So it's now going to the zip file. So if you click here, so this will download. Okay. And also software. Oh, okay. So if you have a problem going to the GitHub or this one, you can download directly from here, the article. Just click here. Okay. You will download the zip file. So it depends because then you will be accessing the server in Japan. So somebody from uh, Africa, maybe it's uh, too difficult to access here. So I don't know. But anyway, you can download from here, article leave, or you can download from here. Okay. And these are some of the files that we use at our training last year at the AIT in Thailand. And these are a little bit uh, big file, 24 hours of uh, observation, one day observation. So if you want to do the 24 hours of a data analysis and that give you a very good idea how GPS looks like and how accuracy improves if you observe for 24 hours. So better you download this data as well. It may take some time depending upon your internet speed. But if you have 24 hours data, like somebody asks whether we can break down into one hour data and so on. So you can just take uh, one hour out of 24 hours and you see what is the accuracy you can get by using one hour data? Whether two hours or four hours data is better than one hour. Okay. So this type of, uh, with this sample data, you can do now lots of uh, uh, different types of uh, data analysis. And uh, this uh, RTK leave is very, very powerful for RTK, PPP, DGPS, and even doing lots of data conversion from one file to another file and even accessing our server here and getting the real-time processing. It can do real-time, it can do post-processing, so it's, I think, better than some of the manufacturers' uh, software, so they have some limitations, but it doesn't have it. And also, you can customize if you can do some programming. Okay? So it gives a lot of uh, flexibility. And tomorrow, we also we provide you, introduce some more additional software by Dr. Eze. He has developed uh, his own RTK processing software. So some uh, that's in some cases that's a little bit better than RTK leave as well. OK, and if you have a UBlox receiver and if you want to do the RTK in real time and all, so you have to set up the receiver to log the RTK data. So by default, those receivers are not uh, uh, will not log the data for RTK. So you need to set up the receiver, this setup. So please check this data, how to do that. We have a very detailed PowerPoint on that. Uh, tomorrow we are not going all these PowerPoints because uh, you can just look at them and we want to save the time for the uh, exercise. Okay, So that's the reason we are not doing all these detailed PowerPoint slides, presentations and discussions. So I recommend to download everything over here. 
and those who are really diehard uh, GNSS learners, so they can go down and they can download all our previous files, lecture notes. There are so many from uh, the other GPS uh, experts uh, in the previous years. If you scroll down, there are lots of lecture notes. So this will be so don't print them. It will be thousands of pages. So that's the download <laughs> and look at the PDF files. So and if you have uh, more details, so please contact us. Um, OK, so these are everything is here. So this page will give you all the information, but these lecture notes are more or less they are duplicated. OK, so every year we have a training and we just have a uh, change in the, one of the few slides. Unless if um, this if this is my slide, so my slides are more or less same, but every year is uh, maybe just a few slides are different. So if you download these slides, you don't have to download the previous file. Okay, but if you see somebody's new names here, so you can download those uh, slides like uh, Gabriela. So he has uh, more on the Genesis error, so, so you can download her slides to see more details on these uh, Genesis errors. Okay, more uh, some mathematics and all. So please have a look at this and please make sure that. This is at least you download OK, this one and this one. Otherwise, we can't do the exercise tomorrow. And also, I strongly recommend this one. This is 24 hours, so please download and you have some time until tomorrow. I think we can do very nice exercise. So this is online and I don't know how we can do very effectively tomorrow. So let's see. OK, so I will open the floor for some questions and then we'll I think we will stop them. Thank yeah. you, Dinesh. Um, I see that the questions few questions we were already answered. Mm -hmm. um, the someone says I don't have Android system. Um, no, you don't need the. Uh, if you don't have Android, you don't need it. But do you have a Windows PC? So tomorrow we are going to use in the computer, not in the mobile phone. OK, okay. so please remember that our exercise will be based on the computer in the Windows, not in the Linux. We don't have a support in Linux. So only Windows computer. And not a Mac as well. So Windows system is compatible and tomorrow's exercise will be based on the Windows computer. Okay. Yeah, that's the problem we might face tomorrow as well. There is already a question saying that they cannot follow the steps, even the simple steps which you showed how to download software. So I believe there is instruction. So I would suggest that you just look at the email which Dinesh sent to everyone about the softwares, uh, link to the web page. There are all the instructions, so I believe you will be able to follow that uh, later today so that you're ready for tomorrow. Um, you might send your questions already by email mm -hmm. if you have any, and we try to look at them before we start mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, I think that's it. I don't mm. think any specific questions. No, they, they, question. they, they have to go to, I in the email, I. I send this link. Yeah. So if they go to this link, the only thing they have to do is click the button. That's all. Exactly. Okay. So <laughs> that's the, all. Just, just see okay, this I made table. a big text. This so is they the all what you see in this first yeah. table, which says software download yeah. links. Please download all of them, and then we will see how yeah. we they, work they with this. They can take a screen yeah. capture now, and yeah. they can just click here. Mm -hmm. So I, I told already that this is a must. OK, this one is not necessary tomorrow. Huh? So this is a must. So RTK leave must be installed. Okay. And okay. these data sets. So RTK leave right. and this data set. So these three is a must. And also I recommend to download this. Okay. That's all. And this is compatible with the um, Windows system, Windows computer. So please make sure your computer is ready, working. 
Yeah. Uh, but you need to do zip and on unzip. So I suppose that you know how to unzip. So I don't go there. And once you launch the RTK leave, you will see the icon like this. Okay, RTK launch. You can you see my screen? Very small. Okay. And if you double yeah. click, you will see this RTK leave uh, something like this. Okay, this one. So in the beginning, you will see very small one. Then article is very nice, but a little bit difficult to understand. So if you see very small icon, then just press the right button. Press the right button, and then you will see that something like uh, this is small, this is square. And if you, you see, oh, it's gone somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You press this with the right button and then it will give you the text guy expand. If you press that, then it will become uh, larger. But anyway, tomorrow we can do that. OK. So just try, just install and try and play with the software. So you just need a few minutes to play around and then you will see all these buttons and they give you a lot of uh, processing power. And then we'll teach you how to use these buttons for data processing. Okay, so this is what we do tomorrow. So, but when you come tomorrow, please make sure that this article leave is working in your computer. Okay, because we we don't wait until you do it. We just keep on talking and just we we go a bit slower, but uh, we need to move our, uh, on. Okay, otherwise we cannot finish on time. Exactly. This is this is just demonstration. It's mm. not real kind of the hands on yeah. exercise. So you have yeah. to understand us and we have a lot of people attending this uh, online course. It's just our trial to to demonstrate what mm. we are doing normally in person training courses mm. of of such kind, which mm. we are planning for the following years as as mm. before. Mm. Um, so with that, I believe we we conclude our um, workshop uh, mm. first day. We would like mm. to thank you all the speakers which are still online with us. And mm -hmm. then, um, as I said, and I repeat, we will download, uh, we will upload all the presentations which were made today onto the website uh, of UN USA and we'll send you the direct link in a few hours. Just be patient with us. We will do it today so that you are able to study them uh, for tomorrow and then mm. uh, ask questions if you still have have mm. them. All right, mm. with that I conclude. Yeah, uh, just, just a minute, just finish. a minute. Yes. Uh, now I am running this graph, so I suppose that uh, there's no problem for our participants to see this. Yes. Can they see this? Can, can some of yeah, you we, who I cannot can, I see? I can clearly see that graphs. Yes. Okay. Okay. With colors yeah. and everything. Okay. So those, uh, yeah, there, uh, there will be two bars or maybe sometimes like this. Okay. Yeah. I don't think so. This is what we'll be doing tomorrow how to do the real time and post processing and all using this article leave software. So we'll explain like uh, the all the steps like this one and what are the things you have to set up and all these options, parameter settings and all. Okay, this will go step by step tomorrow. So I recommend the, the participants to look at the data and just play with the data with uh, our and they can also access our past handout okay, for this. So it is almost the same. So they can download the, our uh, the material. OK, so that's all from my side. Thank you very much, yeah. Dinesh. Um, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. And we're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. We will start at uh, 6, uh, 10 UTC time. OK, thank you. Bye.